Good afternoon to everyone with us from across North America. Shalom, Erev Tov, to those of you joining from Israel. And thank you for being here with us today for our Israel Engage Winter Virtual Summit. I would like to take this time to thank our generous sponsor for this conference, Mr. Paul Bronfman, a proud Hasbara Canada board member, and the Paul Bronfman Family Foundation. I would also like to thank our Hasbara Canada and Hasbara International boards. My name is Daniel Corin. I'm the Executive Director of Hasbara Fellowships Canada, and I am thrilled to be your MC for today. We have an intensive conference for you and a fascinating and diverse group of speakers, including former Canadian Ambassador to Israel Vivian Berkovich, activist and speaker Rudy Rockman, Tair of the amazing Israeli trio Ewa, Liora Rez, aka Jewish Chick, she is the founder of StopAntiSemitism.org, Yusuf Haddad, an Arab Israeli activist and I 24 News Arabic personality, Marina Shihei, an indigenous rights advocate and educator, Isaac De Castro, the co founder of a student led organization, Jewish on Campus, and Joshua Washington, director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. We also have a comedy sketch from Instagram personality Glad Kosher, aka The Yoram. That one is for our younger viewers here with us today. Speaking of which, I'm so proud to announce that all of our sessions today will be moderated by our Hasbara fellows, recent Hasbara graduates, law students, and our Hasbara campus advisors. My friends, we are at a critical point in history where so many of us are divided depending on how we feel about politics, religion, science, or the environment. A time that is so polarizing, thanks especially to social media, that there's rarely any nuance in conversations anymore, and you're quickly labeled based off of 280 characters as either right or left, black or white, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. And everything, for some strange reason, warrants a comparison to the Nazis, the Holocaust, Kristallnacht, or some other event where Jews have suffered. For students on campus, whether in person or online, they need to pass a litmus test just to make sure they can be accepted to the progressive student clubs, to any of the social clubs, and to the groups that claim to support human rights. For Jewish students, however, despite their goal to support human rights and eradicate racism and anti-Semitism and help establish peace worldwide, they are often shunned from participating in any of these causes because they support the right to a Jewish homeland, Israel. Indeed, when it comes to supporting the world's only Jewish state, there is a clear double standard and a challenge presented exclusively to Jewish students, to Israeli students. Today, these students basically have either two choices. Be quiet about your Jewish identity and allow it to be hijacked by political anti-Israel groups who spread outright propaganda, or get involved, become a Hasbara fellow, gain the skills and the confidence necessary to speak up and to do something about it. And that is exactly the role that our Hasbara fellows play on campuses from across North America, from the University of California in Berkeley to McGill University in Montreal. Our Hasbara fellows are speaking up, proactively running campaigns that educate their peers about Israel and Zionism, and fighting back against anti-Semitism and the anti-Semitic propaganda that is constantly hurled in their direction. Our fellows are writing op-eds in national and mainstream papers. They're running Instagram and TikTok accounts where they engage with thousands of other students, and they are on the front lines on campus to refute the anti-Semitic BDS movement and student groups like Students for Justice in Palestine and Students Against Israeli Apartheid. Our Hasbara fellows were active when Leila Khaled tried to speak at San Francisco State University. Our Hasbara fellows were active when PFLP terrorists were invited to the University of Toronto. Our Hasbara fellows were active when an anti-Semite, notorious for saying that Jews are sleazy thieves, was invited by two anti-Israel groups at UBC and York. It is so easy for students to remain quiet and to not be active, 
when fellow students and when professors harbor lies like Israel is an apartheid state or that Jews are not indigenous to the Levant. But thanks to the support of our amazing community and those of you supporting Hasbara, our fellows are able to receive the training, the skills and the confidence necessary to speak up, to challenge their professors, to challenge the misinformation and to offer their own narrative of what it means to be Jewish on campus. You would be surprised of what a difference speaking up makes, especially to other students. And that's why I implore all of you today to support Hasbara, to visit hasbarafellowships.org slash donate. You can donate to either Hasbara Canada or Hasbara International and help us train the next generation of Israel activists on campus. But don't take my word for it. Listen to some of our amazing Hasbara fellows about the important work they conduct on campus and hear for yourselves. My name is Yaron Sternberg and I'm currently a rising junior at Stanford University. When I entered my freshman year, I was a confident pro-Israel advocate. While Stanford had its record of anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric, literally, as I'm making this video, they're cleaning swastikas off of their church. I was confident because I had gone to the conferences, I had done the research, and I had the numbers, the statistics, the facts, all at my disposal. I was ready for debate. Fast forward three months, and I'm emotionally drained. I've been yelled and cursed at, and I really haven't been spreading the knowledge that I, that I genuinely had. I remember sitting in the lecture when a guest lecturer, an Iranian professor, said, supposedly, millions of Jews died in the Holocaust. Supposedly. I was stunned. I was silent in the room. I knew I had to do something. And I decided to write an article to expose the incident and teach people facts about what had happened in the Holocaust. Within a week, thousands had spread my article across the nation and various news outlets had reached out to me. But there was also backlash. Another student on campus completely unrelated to the incident, decided that they were going to write an article suggesting that I had made everything up. They misquoted people and there was just no truth behind what they were writing. It took three weeks for the modifications to be made to their article to indicate that they had lied and I had been telling the truth, that the incident had happened. But by then the damage had already been done. Hasbara forced me to look for the questions, to have those very difficult conversations. I spent a day with a Palestinian worker, his name's Mohammed, and I practiced my Arabic. We bonded over my Yemenite background and we joked, we arm wrestled. We spoke about his story and I spoke about mine. It was there that I found my voice. When he explained to me what BDS would do to his job and to his family, it was completely different than reading something from a book. You can't find people's narratives just anywhere. Hasbara takes you to those hard places. Hasbara is fearless. It teaches you to take control of the conversation. I found my voice. I hope that you can go to Israel. You can have those conversations. You can learn. You can take this virtual tour. And you can take what you've learned and help create your own voice. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first session, The New Middle East, with Vivian Berkovich and Youssef Haddad, moderated by Daphne Kleiman. She is a recent graduate of St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and a proud Hasbara Fellow. Okay, so thank you so much, Daniel. I'm Daphne Kleiman. I was a Hasbara Fellow a couple of years ago, and now I go to school at IDC Herzliya for diplomacy, and I work for the Institute of Global, for the Global Study of Antisemitism and Policy. I'm here with Vivian Berkovich and Yusuf Haddad, and I'd like for you guys to introduce yourselves before I start. Yusuf, you go Vivian, first. you can go first. Wait. Okay, I guess I don't do the short stuff. Ladies, ladies first. Ladies first uh, is always the... Okay, so, so polite. Um, so, hi, I, well, hi Daphne, Yusuf, nice to see you guys. Um, and hello, everybody who is with us. Um, I, gosh, I got a really, okay, the, the short version. Um, 
I, I suppose I'm here because I served as Canada's ambassador to Israel from 2014 to 2016. I was appointed by Prime Minister Harper. Um, and as a political appointee, of course, um, it was understood that I would not continue to serve uh, when the new government, the Trudeau government, um, came into power. Since uh, my service ended, I chose with one of my kids to remain in Israel. And I live in Tel Aviv, do a lot of writing on political topics um, and topics related to foreign policy, Israel. And I'm involved in the medical cannabis business quite extensively, which happened by accident. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. And Yusuf? Uh, so first of all, uh, hello to everyone. It's uh, an honor to be here with you guys. Uh, my name is Yusuf Haddad. Uh, I am uh, from the city of Nazareth, the largest uh, Arab city in, uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, today, I'm the CEO of the organization Together Vouch for Each Other. It's an Arab-Israeli organization that the whole aim and target is to bridge the gaps between Jewish and Arabs here in Israel, uh, uh, to bring the Israeli Arab society closer to the Israeli society in general. Uh, we're working on uh, uh, what, what we call the um, national service, uh, our motto is uh, serve the country while serving our community at the same uh, at the same time. Uh, and by the way, I'm happy to tell you that uh, now, uh, in 2021, there is over 5,500 Arab Israelis volunteering in the national service yearly. Wow! Like within within 10 years, we will see tens of thousands of Arab Israelis volunteering in the national service. That's huge. That's amazing. Uh, that is, that is, I, and, and, and I'm sure that there's a lot of information that I will, will give a lot of, a lot of those in this, uh, in this talk that will shock people about the Israeli Arabs here uh, in Israel. Uh, so this is uh, my job uh, or me volunteering, and also I'm doing it completely volunteering uh, as the, the CEO of this organization. And also uh, I work as a journalist, as a correspondent in uh, uh, I-24 Arabic and English to bring another angle about the Israeli Arabs uh, that we don't see it in the general uh, media. So this is uh, exactly started uh, a month ago, and I'm happy to say that it's already making a huge buzz uh, around the things that I bring uh, to the channel. Uh, and as I said, looking forward to, to talk to everyone here. I got to turn into I-24 so. then now and then because I used to be on there every week when they had the spin room. Go back. And, go back. and then I just became old news. <laughs> You Go got back. the plug. We have a question. Thank you, um, Okay, so I think we're going to be talking today about the New Middle East and the Abraham Accords. So I have some questions, but we can just talk and see where things go. Um, my first question to get us started is um, Are either of you afraid that the current administration, so the Biden administration, um, will put a halt to the Abraham Accords and or the future progress and prospect of peace, even maybe regressing the Middle East to more of an Obama era environment and climate? Well, I'll bite. Yeah, I'm going to jump at that because I mean, it's too much red meat you threw at me. Um, so look, I think I mean, I think there's I think the word I would use is concern more than fear. Um, and clearly, there's been a lot of discussion since <clears throat> Biden became president elect, uh, and actually in the months preceding that, there's been discussion about what are they going to do? Because his main people on the security and diplomacy side seem to be very clear, very unequivocal, in fact, about their preference to return to the Obama kind of you know, doctrine, if we can call it that, reopen. It's been absolutely unequivocal about reopening the negotiations with Iran. Um, but, you know, they've received a lot of blowback. And a lot of it is from people even within the Democrats or their usual supporters. And the reason for that is the Middle East, just like everywhere else, is not a static place. And as committed as they were four years ago to the, their way of doing things and their idea of what the Middle East is and needs, those re realities simply don't exist anymore, right? Mm -hmm. 
some of them, some may, but I mean, the fact is, it, I, I think it's precisely because of the Obama approach to the Middle East that the Sunni countries and Israel became really um, much closer, developed much stronger relationships because they realized they had much more in common. And for those countries and you know, the re most of the countries in the region, the major threat is Iran. And um, so we've seen this absolutely seismic shift in the realpolitik, the geopolitics on the ground and how the countries in the region assess those things. You can't go back. It's like going back and redoing the Marshall Plan, you know, after World War II. This is an arrangement that the countries in the region want. They negotiated and it simply can't be undone. So I think it's going to be very interesting because these, uh, you know, Tony Blinken, who's Obama's secretary of state, uh, is a very, very capable, experienced, bright person. And he understands the complexity of the dynamics. Um, they all do. What we don't know is exactly how they're going to thread the needle. So I would be very, but I would be very concerned because this is this is also Obama's legacy, and they are all very loyal to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to jump in and say, like, from our perspective, uh, you know, as Israelis, the the, the Trump administration did very very good things, uh, you know, uh, yeah. towards Israel. Uh, from standing up uh, to the UN uh, through, you know, recognizing the Golan and, uh, you know, recognizing sovereignty in uh, Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. Uh, but we also need to understand and to remember that Biden has always been a good friend of Israel. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 and that things, uh, obviously, we, we've seen that. So, um, so me, at least I, I'm speaking about me, and I think I speak also for a lot of Israelis, that we are confident that, the, you know, the administration will continue to move forward uh, and protecting uh, the U.S. Uh, you know Israeli uh, uh, friendship, uh, and also we, we you know we have to to remember that uh, Biden uh, opposed the BDS and he criticized extreme figures in the Democratic uh, Party. So uh, you know I, I really think that uh, uh, as much as the, there is concern, but we can definitely see that uh, uh, Biden uh, Biden we, we can we, we can definitely uh, work with uh, with Biden. And uh, I must say that, uh, you know, in general, uh, eventually uh, Israel will try to work as much as is possible uh, with the administration, with the Biden administration. And at the end, we will know that uh, Israel will do anything to protect uh, its civilians. Uh, and I believe uh, that uh, in a way that if we look in the future, uh, maybe there's some sort of a con uh, concerns, but all in all, I'm pretty sure that the relationship between us, between the United States and Israel, it's really very, very good relationship, and uh, and uh, I'm 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 hopeful. I'm hopeful. So I gotta. Uh, can I just? Uh, I want to sort of respond. Um, just offer some different thoughts in relation to what Yosef just uh, shared. I I agree. I think that fundamentally, you know, the U.S. and Israel will continue to have a strong and good relationship, but it was extremely strained under Obama. And what we don't know is if that strain will kind of re-enter things. Because if they do start, they can sort of, because this is what the Obama administration tried to do, they can play this as, hey, Israel, as they did previously, and Saudi Arabia, we're telling you now, you know, like your children, you don't quite get it, but we do, that this is good for you, right? It's a like cod liver oil, you gotta drink it. And they are so committed to their worldview and the way they see things. That's why I say concern because we have seen not a chink in their armor, not a chink. Wendy Sherman, who was in the State Department at the time in our National Security Council, she was the chief negotiator, the lead negotiator on the JCPOA, right? That Iran, the, the deal with Iran. And Wendy is now the UN uh, ambassador for the, for the US. These are very strong signals. And I just wanna add one more thing. This may be unkind and unfair. However, you'll read it everywhere. Biden is generally being perceived as a one-term president. Um, in light of his age, we don't know if there are you know, underlying health issues, but 77 years old. Um, and that means that Kamala Harris is very likely a significant, like when he, she was his pick for vice VP, 
the talk was okay she's really actually the president in like but for real we don't yeah. really know other than very kind of saccharine high level platitudes she's like obama was when he came in he had no record we don't really know what she's going to do what she thinks uh we don't know if and how much she may work to bring in or reel in the the far left of the party we don't know and that's another very big concern is how they're going to particularly after january 6 how they're going to manage that very very um corrosive yeah well I, you thing. know it's uh, it's it's a uh, for me at least i i have to say that it's very important that they uh, uh, I am not a, a diplomatic or a, you know or, or or an American, and and I want to like I'm bringing. Neither the... am I really either. <laughs> <laughs> um, American uh, or have... diplomat, but yeah. <laughs> um, so it is it is it is I'm speaking in a, a, a perspective of an of an Israeli and how uh, I see it. But by the way, uh, talking about uh, you know Obama, obviously it was uh, for Israel at least uh, during that uh, time, especially with the Iranian uh, with the Iran with the Iranian deal, but. Obviously, Israel uh, doesn't want to go and re-enter the, you know, uh, re-enter the, the, the Iranian deal between also American and uh, and and Iran. But we we must know and, and understand that in here in the Middle East uh, and especially in the Gulf, now we have a different uh, point of view, especially with the Abraham Accords and the and the fact is that now also uh, the Emirates and uh, Bahrain uh, and also Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, obviously. Uh, they're also opposing and against any deal with Iran, which which now there's some sort of a, I don't want to say strange, but uh, like it's amazing that now we can say a coalition uh, with the Arab uh, countries and Israel. But it's, I know, it, right? It, it was it was before a coalition. A but block. Nobody about it. A block. Yeah, a block. We're like a exactly. cartel, yeah. like OPEC. We're yeah. a cartel <laughs> so, like OPEC. So like there is a there is a block with with Arab countries and Israel. And if we if we knew about this before, uh, but it was like you know behind the scene. Now it's so obvious, which gives also some sort of a confidence about it, and that's why I said I'm also hopeful. So um, maybe this is the situation that we we will test it. I, uh, by the way, there is another important issue that we need to talk about, which is the Israeli election. Uh, obviously, there's a huge uh, huge uh, you know impact if. BB Benjamin Netanyahu is going to stay in uh, in office or not, and and this could also affect uh, you know how it will be it will be not regarding to you know the pluses and the minuses about it. Oh, you know. Back to you, Daphne. We, you know, we, we're taking the time. It's like <laughs> no, this is amazing. <laughs> I just want to pick on a, something that both of you mentioned. Yusuf, you mentioned how good the Trump administration was um, in the regarding Israel and the UN. And Vivian, you mentioned the new appointed ambassador to the United States at the UN. And we had the Abraham Accords, which were historic. But as far as um, I've seen, they are not actually being reflected in the UN. They don't seem, Israel didn't seem to get any praise. Arab countries are not really being praised. We had a small speech from Bahrain, but that was as much as the voting record isn't that different. There have been several condemnations passed. Why do you think that is from a former ambassador perspective and also from a, an Israeli Arab perspective? Why do you think there's this? Listen, listen. Why hasn't it changed? Well, uh, whatever happened in the UN, we know and we understand uh, that uh, uh, the reality and uh, and uh, and what happens in the world to what happens in the UN, there's like, you know, it's disattached. There's no really connection between reality to to what's going on uh, in uh, over there in the UN. Uh, we've seen it by uh, uh, c condemning Israel uh, more times than uh, if you combine the whole world together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you, you understand that it doesn't really matter. The, the, for me, it's, a, it's, it's very important to be there. It's very important to present, represent Israel. It's very important that, uh, you know, um, uh, a strong figure uh, also to you know uh, to represent Israel with also you know being a, a, a professional and uh, with uh, with uh, with a lot of years of experience um, but the, the the thing is that we need to understand that when you come and represent when we're talking about how finally these peace agreements are not peace agreement between leaders those specific peace agreements especially we were talking about the Emirates it's actually and and Morocco by the way 
It's actually a peace agreement with the people, with the people, and I'm seeing it, and I'm seeing it because I'm actually uh, 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 in a program where we're talking. Just yesterday, I spoke to over 40 Emirati and Bahrain activists, and two days ago, I spoke to over 40 Moroccan activists, uh, and we are launching a, a huge program between uh, Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, and Moroccan and Emirati and Bahrain uh, uh, people. Uh, we're launching a program that they will come here and visit us, and we're gonna go there and visit them. So this is the most important thing. I'm 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 telling you genuinely. I really really don't care about what's happening in the UN. We've seen those resolutions, we've seen those condemns, and we know exactly how it works over there. We've known that for years and years and years. Today, what I'm looking at is what happened with the people. And I'm telling you, it is beautiful. And I will add one more sentence before I pass it to Vivian. Today, and I'm not talking to myself because I'm not a Jew, I'm an Arab, but today you are more safe walking in Dubai than in Paris. And that I do believe that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's astonishing, actually. So I mean, I'm starting to feel like, you know. He's the glass full guy, and I'm the glass empty girl. <laughs> it will um, be a good dynamic. That's the first time they told me that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, listen, I'm an optimist too. Um, but I have to say on the UN, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, but, you know, the thing with the kind of, if I can call it the Biden slash Obama camp, is they still buy into the fairy tale. And I think that, you know, the UN, I don't think, I know, the UN was created in the post-World War II era because there was just tremendous shock and horror at what everyone had allowed to go on. And there was a determination, I believe it was absolutely well-intentioned, that, you know, we as a planet have to behave better. And we're going to sign on to these aspirational, universal, very high ideals. In my view, the the dream was over by the early 50s. Um, And it's just gone downhill since then. And for much of the life of the UN, as Yosef very, you know, correctly points out, Israel has been the, the glue, just demonizing Israel, isolating Israel. And the numbers are there. But... The Democrats, and in particular the Obama-Biden crowd, um, they're globalists, internationalists. They do see organizations like the United Nations as perhaps having gone a bit astray here and there, but as fundamentally sound and critical institutions worth saving and reviving and, in, in fact, reinforcing. Right. And I mean, we all know that day after Biden comes in, they're going to restore the U.N. budget that Trump pulled. They're putting one of their superstar people, Wendy Sherman, in as ambassador. They're sending a strong signal. We believe in this institution so we can see it perhaps um, more cynically, but they see it still uh, as, as an opportunity to change the world. And the UN is the primary vehicle to interact with countries like Iran, right? Because they actually yeah. think, you know, that was the Biden, the Obama doctrine was, let's not, let's not isolate them. Let's, let's lift the sanctions. Let's, you know, if we show them respect and we're nice to them, then, then they'll be nice back. I mean, I would have thought that message had sunk in, but apparently not. And so I do think that they are going to revive all of their efforts to strengthen these international organizations, right? And so there's a real tension there. There's a real tension. We can sit here in Israel and say, oh, here they go again, but they're going to go again. Listen, I I have to be honest. Like we we, we must know that the the Abraham Accords uh, deal, it was like a huge uh, blow in the UN uh, in in terms of- I know. In terms of the influence about the Israeli-Arab conflict. <laughs> and, 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 and I want to add, and, and I think this is the huge uh, sentence. The world moved on, okay? And we understand that we. The Middle East uh, has moved we, on. 
uh, well, the, the world, the Middle East, and we don't need the UN. But you know what? Actually, you said something uh, good. You said something very One good. One thing. moved on. So we don't need the UN, and the Arab world understood that as well. And 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 that's why, for me, I would see it as a as as a huge opportunity. And not only that, by the way, uh, this is also a huge opportunity. I'm gonna like shift it to another uh, another uh, subject, uh, and it shows the world that you can make peace with another Arab world without involving the Palestinian issue. And this is a huge deal. Uh, by the are way, you gonna mention, a... are you going to mention the Kerry clip now, or am I? <laughs> I'm, you... I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you. You can go. take it over, Vivian. You can... <laughs> no, I just wanted to say, I mean, on the, that's such a great point, because at, I believe it was 2016 at the Saban Forum, which is held every year uh, in D.C., and it was all the rock stars of the foreign policy world. Sadly, I never made the list. Um, and... Uh, John Kerry was speaking. He was being interviewed by Jeff Goldberg, the editor of Atlantic, 2016. You, and you immediately understood what I'm talking about. Huh? You immediately of course, went for it, Kerry. Of you course. immediately went for it. Good. I know. We're like telepathic, me and Yusuf. And uh, <laughs> Kerry sat there looking very, very Patrician, as he does, you know, with his, like, glasses, like, the, you know, all of that stuff. And he said, uh, let me make this very clear. There will never be peace in the Middle East until Israel resolves finally the Palestinian conflict. I've heard, and he's sort of like dismissively, I've heard, you know, people talk and Israeli leaders say, no, we can do these bilateral deals. There is a lot of interest in the Arab world. No, 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 no. For anyone who hasn't seen it, you got to dig it out um, because that clip really is the best metaphor for the Obama administration's approach. And again, to me, the unanswered question, and I think it's probably very much unanswered now within, you know, the meetings of uh, the transition team for the Biden presidency. The unanswered question is how, how loyal are they going to be the Biden people to that idea? I mean, the other thing you have to remember is they're smart, they're caring, they're professional, they're all those things. They're also human beings with egos. And they serve this man, Obama, who they think is like, I mean, he's sort of got, you know, kind of cult God status. And they see this as um, a, a significant taint on his legacy and on his principles. And those are their principles and their legacy too. At the end of the day, you know, even uh, when I was in office and people, you know, you're interacting with incredible people all the time. People would ask me, what's it like? And I said, it's like high school. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously we're functioning at a different level, but you know what? All of those complex interactions and the egos and the popular people and the not popular, it never, changes i'm sorry to say for those of you who peaked in high school or didn't peak yeah no that's an excellent that's an excellent metaphor actually i do want to go back to the the john Kerry that we were talking about because i really um in, like that the the idea that we can ever move forward without solving the palestinian issue i really like that to talk about that and one thing that I had written down that I wanted to ask both of you is that we have prominent diplomatic um, figures such as like the head of human rights, Ken Roth and Amnesty International. It doesn't matter what Israel do. We're vaccinating. We, we, we are doing accords and all they will tweet about because that's what they do. They just tweet is how Israel, we, the Palestinians, the Palestinians are suffering. It doesn't matter what Israel do, the Palestinians. So I would right. love to hear what you guys think about that. Well, I have to because um, I'm actually working on a, an in-depth piece on this issue that I'm going to be filing tomorrow. I write for Commentary Magazine in the States an awful lot. It's an excellent platform because you can you know, really get at stuff. Um, so I happen to be very, very up to speed on, on this issue. And look, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of my working title is the anatomy of the emergence of a new Jewish blood libel. So they, 
under the Geneva Convention, because they're saying Israel's, you know, criminal as usual, breaching every standard of decency, you know, international human rights criminal, Geneva Convention breaches, blah, blah, blah. Geneva Convention requires the occupying power, and no one's disputing that Israel is occupying, well, some are, but I'm not, that Israel's occupying the West Bank. Uh, Gaza's a little more complex. And Israel had a responsibility, has a responsibility under Geneva, the Fourth Convention, to provide health care. The Oslo Agreements, over 25 years ago, were negotiated between the parties directly. And, and they were very detailed. And the Palestinians enthusiastically assumed full responsibility for a number of powers, education, security, land use, which I realize is a controversial statement, um, health. And in particular, they specified vaccines. Now, it's just kind of, you know, what the Israelis have done is they work very cooperatively and very effectively with the Palestinian Authority and their health standards there are actually quite high. They're in many ways higher than a lot of countries in Western Europe. They're doing a heck of a better job than Canada in procuring vaccine and, and starting to um, plan for a, a vaccine rollout. And the idea is that they have autonomy and they want autonomy. This is about nation building, demonstrating you can do it. So what exactly is the argument? The Palestinians want it. Israel wants it. Palestinians are doing it. So what? Israel, even though they're, and they say this, they say this, that even if the Palestinians don't want help, which is contrary to Oslo, Israel should force, they should just go in there because they're the occupying power and say, we're here and we're doing everything. I mean, they have a million arguments that are ridiculous. It's yeah, absolutely uh, ridiculous. And I would say, to, hang on, I would say to them, okay, well, you know what? I actually don't like what's going on in your schools and your education system because I know you have curriculum, you know, math problems. Okay, if I kill three Jews and then I kill 20 Jews and I divide it by, right? It's, uh, there is an incitement riddled curriculum. I'd like to go in and take over your schools and your curriculum. So Amnesty's got to pick a lane, right? Yeah. The, the test isn't, is Israel doing a better job more quickly than um, Russia? The test is, is are the Palestinians doing a, a good job taking care of their population? It's a reasonableness standard. It's not the Israel, you know, top of the world standard. Canada's failing that one. Yeah. So, but, but and the Palestinians, hang on, the Palestinians never even saw this like they we know they were surprised they're like all of a sudden there's all this noise in the western media what the hell's going on here they were yeah. like there wasn't a problem this is about it's, just demonizing israel because they hate jews and you know what the usual i totally thing. The usual respect thing. that i totally respect that i don't like it but at least if you're just a rabid jew hater have the integrity to come out and say so Hold on. Let, let's, then, let's, you know, let's figure out. Let's talk about two things. One, uh, for those, because there is a lot of people that doesn't really understand that there is two million Israeli Arabs living in Israel, and you know, with full rights and everything. Uh, right. Uh, by the way, 1.5 million are Israeli Arab Muslims, 145,000 Israeli uh, uh, Arab Christians, 145,000 Israeli Arab Druze and 130,000 Israeli uh, Arab Bedouin Muslims. So now and the that Circassians, we, uh, and the Circassians. Sorry? About, ah, the, the Circassians. Circassians. Yes, but, yeah, and, but the, the Circassians okay. are, not, are not, they don't speak Arabic, and they're, so, sorry, they speak Arabic, but they're not Arabs. They are from Kafkaz, so they are a minority, but they're not from the Arab society. Okay, so, okay. Um, so, so we just, we have to say it, first of all, that vaccine is open to all Israeli citizens, including the two million Arabs. That for a start. Now let's talk about the Palestinians. And you said you said the uh, Rivian and, and a, a key a key sentence where you say that they're not taking care of their own people and expecting others. Um, I don't know if people understand how much a, a, a vaccine costs, but one dope is about ten dollars. Israel is paid thirty dollars in order for uh, for us to get it faster, uh, which is fine. But let's say let's say the Palestinian leaders 
negotiate the vaccine to to get a vaccine with a ten dollar uh, per dope, and which means, for instance, in Gaza there is two million people. You put twenty million dollar, and you can actually vaccinate the whole society over there. But what Hamas actually do? Let's talk. I understand there's laws, and I understand we're talking about uh, you know uh, 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 if we want to go in terms of uh, any uh, professional uh, 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 talk, whatever. I'm speaking uh, 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 solely from the point of you know common sense. Hamas gets millions and millions of dollars every year from all kind of places, from Qatar to the U to the uh, European countries, and I don't know which organizations. They decide to put these money on building ter uh, terror tunnels, rockets, and paying their own people. I've seen it. I've have witnesses that came from Gaza and spoke to me about it, telling me that the money goes only for who is relative to the Hamas leaders. Which means that when you come and talk about Israel, but you have money that you don't spend on your people, you can't literally lecture us. That's about Hamas, specifically about Hamas. The terrorist organization that controls Gaza, that controls two million Palestinians, and does nothing. I always, by the way, say, give me five years. I swear to you, give me five years with the budget yearly Hamas taking, I will make Gaza little Singapore. I'm not joking. Now, as for the West Bank and the complicity of the West Bank, especially I'll do it before. I'll Sorry? do it before. You do it before. I'll do it before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna argue there. All <laughs> right. You, you have more. You have more uh, uh, experience there than me, so probably you're right. The power um, duo. <laughs> Both of you can do it. Uh, we'll we do have it an Arab years. spokesperson, an English Hebrew spokesperson. We'll do it <laughs> together. All together, right. we'll do it in two years. So as for as Amazing. for uh, as for the West Bank. We understand that there is a complicity because of the way we are talking about, also in terms of uh, uh, you know legal uh, uh, issues. But eventually, the same thing we talk about. But when when the Palestinians want Israel, you know, to uh, take control, okay, and to help, they would say, "Oh, Israel is not helping." But if Israel do something as sort of taking control over the Palestinian Authority, they would say, "Oh, whoa, 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 you're taking control of us." No, so. Uh, what I mean is that eventually we need to understand that um, people who hate Israel, it doesn't matter if it's uh, because of anti-Semitism, because of Israel existence, or anyway, they will mm. still talk about Israel in that way. We move on. We show, by the way, uh, this is something that we do in, in, in our organization in terms of also social media. We talk about this hypocrisy. We talk about this hypocrisy and, and, and people who, uh, some of those people who talk about like this doesn't even uh, uh, recognize Hamas or Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. So you understand that there's nothing to talk, to, to talk about. So you move on. And by the way, one last thing to talk about, and this is something that any citizen of any country would say. First of all, we will vaccinate ourselves, including the Israeli Arabs who are living in Israel because they are part of Israel. We vaccinate ourselves. We take care of ourselves. And if we help not just Palestinian uh, Authority or Hamas or whatever, also Cyprus wanted the uh, help. But we will help after we take care of ourselves. Point. And that's how it is. So I hope it made it clear uh, also to divide and separate between the Arabs living in Israel and the Palestinians both in Gaza and the West Bank, and also to divide and, and, and explain to everyone, we take care of ourselves. We want to finish with this. What happened later? Israel already helped tons of times the Palestinians, even though they are uh, uh, dealing with uh, with terrorists. I'm I'm a bit more uh, uh, hard about that uh, issue in terms of uh, you know there is no negotiation or dealing with terrorists. But uh, you know a politician in Israel, uh, including uh, people who are already now in control, they think it differently. Fine, no problem. But as come to the vaccine, listen, there's no even an issue. People can talk. Let them talk. We will do, and we continue to do our job. Thank you. Um, great answers from both of you. Um, well, I want to move on to more of a campus-focused approach because we do have our fellows watching, and we need to help them I on site. <laughs> um, so one of the big things um, that I see is the a lack of understanding of what the Abraham Accords are and if they actually help the Palestinian Israeli Arabs, people don't really understand. So how do we um, communicate this to campus students? How can we 
take them away from the pan-Arabist idea that anything that is good for Israel cannot be good for Palestinians, which is something that I saw a lot as a, as a student. I, I, I'll, I'll start on that. First of all, we, we need to understand that the, a, a, a saying that anything is good for Israel when we are signing a peace agreement with Arab countries, not good for Palestinians, is the most idiotic thing I could hear. And do you know where I heard it also from? I heard it also from the leaders of the joint list, the Arab joint list here in Israel, when they voted against that peace agreement. Now listen to this and listen to this carefully. The Arab joint list, they were the only one who voted against the peace agreement in the parliament, Israeli parliament, in the Knesset. The first people, and this is by fact, the first people to get on the plane and to go uh, as a tourist and to do businesses as well, they were the Israeli Arabs. Israeli Arabs. Why? It's simple. It's our mother tongue language. We know the uh, uh, the traditions. Okay. We, 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 we're coming, you know, we, we speak the same language as I said. Uh, and, and this opened opportunities for Israeli Arab to do business, a successful business. Uh, you know, further, we're already seeing that the election are coming in, 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 the, in, 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 in two months, on, on, on March. We've seen that the joint list, because some of, some of their actions, they're losing more than 30% of their power. They're losing over five seats in the Knesset, which is huge. That's huge. Um, so we've seen that what they did, actually the Israeli Arabs voted and said, no, we are against uh, uh, your vote, uh, voting against the agreement, uh, and we are uh, in favor of those peace agreements. So they, the Arab leaders here in Israel, voted against, against the interest, the Israeli interest, the Israeli Arab interest, and when we come to the Palestinians, talk about the Palestinians. Listen, people are saying that because of those deals, uh, the annexation didn't happen. Uh, and people talking about because of that deal, now there is a possibility for renegotiation with the Palestinians. I'm talking about, about, about uh, going to the, the, the table and to discuss uh, uh, a peace, uh, peace process. Um, when you connect those things, when we talk about peace, when we talk about peace with Arab countries, you are already, for me at least, okay, I'm speaking by the way on, 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 my, on my behalf. For me, you already lost me in, 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 in the interest of hearing you. Going back towards, to, through the course of history, we know how much the Palestinian uh, uh, leaders missed their chance uh, and missed tons of opportunities. Uh, or as Abba Evan said, the Palestinians and never missed a chance to, or missed the opportunity to miss an opportunity. We've seen that towards the, the, the history. But I want to quote the former ambassador, the Saudi ambassador uh, in, in the United States. And I, I urge anyone, it's actually uh, 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 it was translated to English uh, by uh, Al Jazeera. No, not Al Jazeera. I'll, I'll find I'll find and I'll tell you exactly where, 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 where it was but was translated his uh, three episodes, each one 45 minutes, to English. And I urge you to go and watch this because that, that was amazing uh, uh, talk with the former ambassador when he revealed all the truth about the relationship between Palestinians and the Arab countries. Ended up by, sum it, I'm, I'm going to sum it up by saying, when he said, we stood year by year with the Palestinians giving them everything they want, although we know that they're wrong, only, only to be, uh, after that, to be attacked by them, only to be attacked by them, only to be condemned by them, because if we did something as A, B, or C, that wasn't suitable to them. Knowing that, by the way, again, he said that, knowing that they were wrong. Knowing that the Palestinians had tons of opportunities from Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat didn't even sign an agreement and, and he, he ran away back, although the Saudi government gave him a, 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 a private jet to go and fly and actually sign agreements. So what I'm saying is that the Arab world understood that we say it in Arabic, khalas. Khalas is enough. Khalas. Yes. They understood. Yes. That's why uh, uh, talking about it and regarding whatever the Palestinians, just go and ask the Arab world. They will answer it better, even even better than me. 
Vivian, do you have so anything I'm gonna, to, for um Yeah, I just have a very, very quick, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, just modification add on to that. Um, I, I think that everything uh, that Yusuf puts forward is, is uh, bang on. Um, and I, I think that also it's really important to, to look at the Palestinian approach to the issue. And that's an approach that, you know, we're kind of coming full circle. Their approach has been maximalist and obstructionist. What do I mean? They have their kind of 150%, um, you know, here's our wish list. And we're just absolutely, not only are we not deviating, we're just going to keep ratcheting it, ratcheting it up. It's an absurd situation. There were wars. They were wars started by countries around Israel um, and they lost. And there are consequences to that. Um, Israel is sitting on this land and the Palestinians are the only group in the world in the world, since this is one of the biggest travesties of the UN. Since the inception of the UN, there is a UN Human Rights Commission that deals with all refugees. And then there's the special UNRWA, United Nations Relief Works Agency, that just deals with Palestinians. They're so different from the Rohingya, from, I mean, go all around the world, pick your refugee. And one of the more interesting aspects of this is that uh, not only do they have their own special agency, but this agency promotes two fictions that feed this, this obstructionist Palestinian approach to peace. One is the so-called law of return, where they say every single Palestinian that can demonstrate ancestry and uh, mandatory Palestine, which by the way, includes most of uh, the country of Transjordan, kingdom of Transjordan. Every single Palestinian that can demonstrate a connection, they have a right to return, okay? Right of return and they can reclaim their homes and Bob's your uncle. Well, then there's a second part to that, which is the Palestinians are the only refugee group in the world where refugee status is grandfathered. What does that mean? That means in real numbers that at the time of the creation of the state of Israel, I'm pretty sure it was about 750,000 Palestinians. Um, and today we have, what is it, Yosef? Five, six, seven, eight million Palestinians. And they all claim refugee status, right? Because the descendants and the, you know, the descendants Just, of the descendants. By the way, a huge... Hang on. But you, there know, were... you know, for me, it's disgraceful to say that they're refugees because the way refugees live so, in the world I and know. the way they live. They live very well. But you I can't think really compare. Re Stick with me. No, you can't. But the, but what's really important is is the way all the rules, all these legal def so-called legal definitions, just BS, they're political, the way they're bent. They're bent to promote yeah. this Palestinian narrative. Why? And I say, sadly, that at the root of it all is this really rabid Jew hatred, some call it anti-Semitism, that has always been institutionally <sighs> entrenched in the West. Now, I am the daughter of refugees. I don't have refugee status. I don't have any right of return to where they came from. Not that I particularly want to go there, but... Why does the Pal why do the Palestinians have these special rules? And these rules, I could take you around the world, but we don't have time. They've never been applied anywhere else. Everything is special for Israel. And the Palestinians for decades have really um, squandered the goodwill of their Arab brothers and sisters. And it got to a point where, you know, and Obama fed this fantasy of theirs. He was constantly coming down hard on the Israelis behind the scenes. Um, you know, you're the, you're the ones with the power. You have to give everything up. No, actually, they have to come to the table, too. And they have to compromise on their, their dream of annihilating Israel, yeah. which is still to this day. Exactly. To this day, it is in the Hamas Charter and it is in the PAPLO Constitution. So... You know, sorry, those aren't just words. We 
Jews, and I think uh, many Arab Israelis understand this, we take it seriously when people talk about destroying us. Call us crazy. Thank you both so, so much. This has been amazing. And we have some um, fellows, I believe they're high school fellows, um, that are going to come in and ask some questions. So, I Amazing, because I'm at 14% on my computer. <laughs> That's okay. perfect timing. I think Let's we do have it. Eden. Hi, Hi, Eden. My name is Eden Kraft, and I'm a high school intern for Hasbara at Tifara Space Yaku. And I was wondering what, in your opinion, would be the best way for students to use this momentum of Arab countries making peace with Israel to combat BDS on campus? I think that that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure because, I mean, what you're doing is ask, it's a really high level question linking to very different issues, right? But, you know, you can do it, I think it's almost like on a case by case. I mean, BDS on campus, they attack Israel for, you know, war crimes, they, you know, all these horrible things. And I think you have to isolate each one. For example, you know, I expect that uh, on campus right now, they're, well, if they're on campus, you know, they're, they're raging about the latest blood libel, right? That, you know, we're prevent Israel's preventing uh, vaccines from, from being uh, delivered to or procured by uh, the Palestinian Authority. So, you know, we're doing this great job vaccinating Israelis, but we're screwing Palestinians, which is a complete lie. Um, and so, you know, that's what campus activists are going to be dealing with right now, I'm sure. Right. And then they'll be, you know, they then, you know, the conversation, the dialogue happens where, you know, they talk about how uh, Israel's betrayed everything and they're horrible and their war crimes and this and that. Well, how do you explain the peace? Right. I mean, you have to, I, I think that's how it comes out. Um, but it's a really good question. I'm going to turn it over to you, Seth. Like, how do you, you know, you're probably, you're really saying that what I'm talking about as I'm thinking out loud here is playing defense. You want to play offense? Yeah. You have to take control always, of the narrative. And I guess throw it. In, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I was thinking out loud, you know? Um, and so I think, I'll, yeah, I'll, you go I'll tell out you, there and I'll tell you, you something go about ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll tell you something about what I believe because we work in this. I've actually uh, faced and uh, been in a debate also in television and around campus in the United States debating anti-Israeli activists, BDS activists. I've also debated the, the BDS leader uh, in, in South Africa as well. Uh, check that video, by the way, because he got humiliated there. Uh, so this is uh, something as a bonus. But I believe in three things, and then I will refer to uh, Eden's uh, question. Uh, uh, there is three ways, three methods to do Hasbara. Uh, for me, the first one is attack. We don't apologize. I don't apologize for Israel exist. I don't apologize for Israel doing what Israel is doing and successful and, 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 and being a, a, a startup nation and vaccination state. Um, and uh, when someone attacks Israel, I don't get, and especially if he's lying, because if someone attacks Israel and I know that he's criticizing and the criticizing is actually good, which is right away leads me to the third thing that I believe in. But uh, if he is lying and twisting the facts, I don't let him continue doing that. I attack immediately. This is what also I did on TV or in the campuses. Attack, attack, attack. The second one is back your, uh, uh, your talk uh, with facts. And the third one, accept those criticism if they are true and find a solution to them. So now that we understand what is the methods to stand against anti-activist, uh, anti anti-Israeli activists, let's talk about what happened with the Abraham Accords. I'll just say one thing. Look, before the Abraham Accords, all the Palestinians were talking about the Emiratis, the, their, their brothers, their sisters, part of the nation, the Arab nation. Once the Emiratis said, listen, we want to look for our interests. We want to look for what's good for our nation as well, which is doing connections with Israel because soon the oil will not be number one and we need to go to high tech and whatever. And uh, yeah, and so they start taking care of their interests. When they let go the interests of the Palestinians and they uh, endorse their interests themselves, the Palestinians automatically start attacking them. By the way, today they are attacking them more than they're attacking the Jews. If you say that you're a Marathi or you say that you're a Jew Israeli, yeah, yeah. there's a highly, highly possibility that you will be attacked more if you're an Emirati. Okay? 
so we understand that the the point their point of view it's not about you know the peace agreement it's not about it's just about israel being israel and dealing with israel and now we've seen it we've seen it with the moroccan we've seen it with the, you, you should see how they go to the the the, 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 the like the mosque the, the al-aqsa mosque which is uh, what, it's one of the the, the most important uh, uh, holy place is Mecca in uh, Saudi Arabia, but uh, Al Aqsa uh, it's uh, it's uh, one of the uh, important uh, places for the Islam, and over there, over th- in this holy site, you treat everyone by the Islam. Yes, you treat everyone with respect, even if he's not a Muslim. But when a Muslim come to visit Al Aqsa and you spit on him. And you treat him as, uh, as, as an animal. And you do all these things when he's also, you know, a Muslim. That shows the true color of those people. And when you face someone from uh, the BDS talking about these things, just show them these pictures. Just show them the videos. Just talk to them about how they treating because they did that. Attack back. Attack back. Don't say, oh, listen, we try. No, not at all. I hope I answered your question. Eden? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Eden. Bye, everyone. Say hi to your dad. <laughs> I will. So my, my name's Noah Lewis, and I'm a uh, first-year uh, Hasbara fellow in law school. Wow. Oh, no. At the University of Windsor. That's so okay. Cool. Nice. So my question for you is, so what role, if any, can Canada play in furthering the historic milestones of the Abraham Accords? <laughs> oh, dear. <Brilliant. laughs> I, okay. So here's the thing. It may come as a shock that I disagree fundamentally and totally with pretty much everything that seems to pass for the foreign policy of the current Canadian government. Uh, I don't think that feminism, much as I, as a feminist, you know, pro- like, you know, support it, I don't think that feminism and climate change make a foreign policy. Um, I have good reason to believe and to say that this government does not have a principled, disciplined approach to foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, in which they've demonstrated almost no interest other than through a feminist prism, okay? And so I don't think this government um, can play much of a role based on the way they seem to prioritize at the moment, uh, which is sad. At its, at its best, Canada, you know, is a so-called middle power, but Canada, you know, we, we can't get in there with the big guys. We don't have their clout, but, okay, I gotta move before I like, I, I, I'm gonna talk, right? I'm gonna stop the video, but I'm gonna keep talking, okay? But I have to put my power in my computer. Um, so Canada can, as a middle power, do a tremendous, amount. Um, it, it can do so much behind the scenes. It can act as a kind of broker between the major powers, you know, to generate discussion track two, which is sort of diplo speak for, um, um, you know, confidential or off the record, so to speak, discussions between diplomats. That's what Canada has typically done. All right. I'm going to be in a different spot now, guys. Voila. And that's the Canadian role and that's the Canadian place. Um, Sorry, I'm just, the cord's not. But what can Canada do now? Canada has pretty much no credibility in the Middle East, none. They blew their credibility in Saudi, right? That was a bit of a fiasco a couple of years ago. And they really don't do anything. The big thing for Canada was bringing in Syrian refugees, which was a great thing to do, but again, that doesn't, a foreign, doesn't make a foreign policy. Uh, on Iran, they have been schizophrenic. Um, so I think that, you know, you need a government with credibility in the region, which this one does not have. And so right now I would say not much. Um, I don't know if you noticed that uh, when the Abraham Accords 
were announced, um, there was a deafening silence from Ottawa. It took them a week, maybe even two to, you know, issue their bland, say nothing statements like, oh, you know, we think peace is great. You know, uh, I'm sure that the Abraham Accords absolutely knocked their socks off because it's not how they are much more Obama ish in how the bureaucrats I'm talking about too, not just the political people and the bureaucrats really run things. They're much more aligned with the Obama worldview. Um, they would be absolutely uncompromising um, in terms of taking the position that until the Palestinian issue is fully resolved, nothing can happen. This goes against every, um, every bit of orthodoxy in that department. And that's the way it's always been. So it took, I, I'm sure they're just shell-shocked and they're just, what can they do? You have no credibility um, and you have no real principle. So sorry to say, like, I think we're in the wilderness on this one as a country. Change of government or um, a change in the policy approach could change things. Exactly. That's I what I was thinking also. Change of policy, yeah. which is very important to do. Well, but you're not going to see if you're not going to see a radical shift of policy in this no. government. I mean, it's the same. It's the same mess that they've created with China. Canada actually had so much. You can hate Stephen Harper. You can love him. But one thing he did have was credibility among world leaders. And he was punching and Canada was punching way above their weight, way above their weight because he was respected. He was smart. He was principled, you know, and they knew that he he came at things in a dis came at issues in a disciplined way. Um, the current government, I think, uh, is the complete. I'm sorry to say, opposite. I say that with no pride, by the way, none. As a Canadian, I'm a proud Canadian, and I'm a proud Israeli, and uh, I think mean, Canada could and should be doing so much better. And I agree Thank exactly you. in the last sentence that I think Canada could do much more. In that term, and obviously what Vivian uh, said, uh, I think uh, it sums it up uh, very well. Uh, so, yeah. Oh my God, that's the third gold star you've given me tonight. It's nighttime, by the <laughs> way, where we are. Thanks. Thanks, though, Noah. I think it's, um, yeah, it is what it is, man. <laughs> very good answer. Yeah. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. Hi, um, I'm Eden. I'm from Montreal, Quebec. Um, I go to McGill University. I'm studying psychology. I did the Hasbara Fellowship Program in 2018, so I was there in the summer, and I've been an active member on campus ever since. I run a club at McGill, and I'm constantly, I interned for Hasbara Fellowships this summer, actually, and yeah. Well, you've got your hands full at McGill, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, what does Israel need to do to establish peace with countries that are not so open to peace, like Turkey and Lebanon? Oh, you want to go? First of all, we have peace with Turkey. Uh, we have uh, we have embassies uh, in, in in Ankara, and they have embassy in Tel Aviv. But the fact is that uh, although Obama although is just hang on. Exactly. Erdogan went crazy when yeah, 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 yeah. signed. That's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. No, but th this is the whole idea. This, this is the hypocrisy that I was talking about. And actually, it comes in a different forms. Because when the United States uh, uh, said that, uh, announced that uh, they're moving the embassy uh, to, to Jerusalem, Erdogan threatened to cut relations with Israel, not with the United States. <laughs> because he doesn't even allow himself to cut the, the, the relationship with the United States. You see, so you understand how idiotic it is and how uh, uh, hypocrite uh, it is from his side. But besides that, we understand also that uh, when it comes to, to talking about the peace agreement, there was some criticism about him from the Arab world, from the Arab world itself, not even from Israel, when they told him, what are you talking about? You're talking about the peace agreement between the Arab countries to Israel while you have an open embassy in Tel Aviv, in the middle of Tel Aviv, and you have an Israeli embassy in the middle of Ankara. So who you're really joking and, 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 and trying to fool. So, uh, uh, and, and, and I must say, if you go to Turkey, despite, and this is our main problem, it's what you see on the social media, it's what you see on the news. If you go to Turkey on the street, you would see 
Israelis shopping and well before the corona obviously. yeah not anymore yeah yeah yeah, yeah. before the corona obviously you would even see Israelis, before that yeah but. yeah no no it's still even with a lot of problems still uh, 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 airplanes uh, w- went to, uh, to to Turkey now with Lebanon and this is a very serious issue uh, and we saw we, I, I've seen it because I'm, I'm not joking hundreds of Lebanese uh, turned into uh, my Facebook page uh, uh, which I publish a lot of things about Lebanon and in the world and Arab world in general and here in Israel and they, they said listen after the huge explosion that happened there they 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 fit up with Hezbollah. They fit up with what they're doing, and and the, again the people uh, doesn't they, they they actually say that even in the media they said what Israel did to us comparing to what uh, Hezbollah uh, did to the Lebanese people. Unfortunately, Eden and 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 everyone understand this. Unfortunately, as long as Hezbollah controls Lebanon and Hezbollah controls Lebanon. Nobody can, because that's why when someone says that Lebanon is a democratic uh, country, it's BS. It's not. Because when you have terrorist organizations control your board, when you have terrorist organization uh, dictating whatever happened, the, 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 the second Lebanon war, it started because of Hezbollah and, and, and putting Lebanon in a war because of Hezbollah. When they still in control, Lebanon will never, never achieve peace with Israel. I'm telling you, and listen to this carefully, the minute Hezbollah is out, the next day there is a peace agreement between Lebanon and, and, and Israel, and you will see a train stations from Beirut to Tel Aviv. 100%. Strongly disagree with you on one really critical point. Hezbollah is Iran. I'm joking, no, but, no, I mean, it's, but I'm, it's, what I'm saying, the proxy. So. We understand, we, everyone the understands Bala that Hezbollah is, the Bala is supported by Iran and by the money of Iran and the, and the, uh, 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 and the, the extreme uh, Islamic Shia. But, uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, they're not gonna, going anywhere. But they, they themselves, you know, they have a political party, Al Amal, a, a Lebanese political party. They have representative in the Lebanese parliament. So we understand that they moved from sort of a militia to small army to even a political uh, power and that's why when they represent like this Lebanon we have zero chance of making any peace with them zero chance with the Lebanese so uh-huh. when when we see that uh, uh, when we f- deal with Iran slash Hezbollah then and only then we can see a peace agreement with the uh, Lebanon and, and I'm telling you it would be the easiest peace agreement I'm not I'm regime not so let me I'm gonna just jump in very briefly and then, um, look, regime change in Iran, which could happen. Uh, it could not. But if regime, if there is regime change in Iran, the ramifications, in my view, in a positive way for the region are huge. And um, as Yosef says, it uh, probably overnight, o- overnight creates an opportunity for night and day relations with Lebanon. Um much easier for Saudi Arabia to normalize relations uh, with Israel and other nations in the region. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the last few months have been absolutely remarkable, right? It's just been this complete, you know, I think even to people in the fishbowl, um, really quite a surprise at what transpired. Um, and I think that we should count our blessings and focus on what we have. There's a lot of really serious, intense work to be done to see that these, what is it, four or five normalization agreements we have now with various countries in the region, that they have real heft, you know, that we start to see the relations truly develop. One of the huge differences between this round of normalization and the peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan um, is that the treaties with Egypt and Jordan were primarily, um, you know, they, they came from security concerns and uh, they've been very, very frigid pieces. They really are about political, uh, you know, interaction at the highest levels and security interaction. And that's important, right? But I happen to know from a very, when I was in office, a very senior Egyptian official who told me, he was very, 
very close relationships with uh, President Sisi. And he said uh, that President Sisi has made it clear repeatedly that he really, really wants to develop the people-to-people -people ties with Israel. Because without the people-to-people -people ties and connections, the peace is nothing. I won't get into the complexities of Egypt and why that can't and won't be done anytime in the near future. But what I do want to point out is that the truly visionary part of the Abraham Accords is that they focus on the people to people. Yes, okay. there obviously are political ties. Yes, there obviously are security ties. But I mean, Yosef, we're here. You, it was like a switch went off. The well-orchestrated social media and media campaigns to portray one another in a positive light, to, to promote interaction, to promote cultural missions and, and economic missions and tech missions, every kind of mission you could dream of, you know, and, and it's, it's astonishing. Like it's real, you know, I'm a cynic, I'm a skeptic. And I have to say, I have been absolutely charmed and seduced by this because Everyone's talking about it. You see people go back and forth. You see things on the news all the time. And I was speaking to, you know, um, an American who official who was very involved in this process. And it was interesting because I asked him about each individual country and the character and this and that. And he said, the Emiratis are just exceptional. You know, they really come into this well-intentioned, well-meaning, um, and for all the normal reasons that you want peace with the country. So I think we ought to focus on the embarrassment of riches that we've uh, harvested over the last few months, make them work, show everyone how great it can be, and then we can take our next steps. I'm not in a hurry. It'll come. Manage oh, Iran. Yeah. Do, right? We got enough to do, right, Yosef? We're we got busy enough. here. We got enough. <laughs> yeah, we got our hands full. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye Thank you. Bye. Bye. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Vivian, so, so much. It's an honor to have you here. Yusuf, amazing. You guys said incredible things and it was a, a really good like back and forth between the two of you. This, this, this was incredible. Thank you so good much. Good chemistry. No, that was great. Thank you so much. And you did a wonderful job managing us, which I would never want to do. <laughs> I, I, I it was, totally... You guys managed yourselves at some point. I, I totally agree. First of all, shout out to Daphne, really, you were uh, amazing as well. Vivian, it was really nice, uh, you know, talking uh, talking to you. Very interesting conversation as well. Uh, next time we should do it after the Seger here in Israel and uh, have uh, have dinner. Cup of coffee. It's a date. It's a date. It's a date. I'll Absolutely. come Thank down you. to Tel Aviv. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, Daphne, Vivian, and Yosef. That was truly an informative experience. I appreciate it, especially as Yosef correctly asserted that he served in the IDF, not the JDF, because he fought to protect the lives and the rights of Israelis alike, whether Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Druze, or any other religion. I would now like to introduce our next session, Explaining Jewish Indigeneity, with Marina Shihei, she is an indigenous rights advocate and educator. This session will be moderated by Isabella Hazan. She is a bright young Hasbara fellow in Montreal who is currently a law student at the University of Ottawa. Over to you, Isabella. Thank you, Daniel. Allow me to introduce Marina. Marina Shihei has an extensive experience in global development, innovative philanthropy, and multilateral diplomacy. Marina is a serial entrepreneur herself. She has been in the digital startup space since the early 2000s, built and mentored and advised startups across the globe. She also developed nearly a billion dollars in sustainable real estate and biofuels. She's the first woman of color in the United States to have founded a technology incubator, Accelerator, and, a pioneering, uh, and pioneers in the academic startup diplomacy space. Marina has received numerous global awards and fellowships with her work having been featured in both domestic and international outlets such as Forbes, Associated Press, Bloomberg, and more. She received her education from the University of Pennsylvania and the Wharton School of Business. She is currently CEO and board chair of the Development Commission and NGO in the United Nations, as well as a partner at, the, at Zia Impact, through which she works with clients on impact strategy and sustainable economic development. 
She, live in, she lives and works in New York and New Mexico, where she belongs to the Tewa people of Northern Rio Grande Pueblos and, she, and this party. Marina is, an, is a, Marina is an impassioned advocate for indigenous rights, leadership, and visibility. Thank you, Marina. Thank you for having me, Isabella, and Daniel also. <laughs> so this, this conversation is going to be about Judaism and the Jewish people as an indigenous peoples. And I think it's important that we start off with saying, what is the Jew and how we identify it? So Judaism is not just an ethno-religion, but also an ethno-indigenous religion. And when we say ethnicity here, we mean the fact, state of belonging to a social group that has a common national or cultural tradition. And we mean religion, we mean the belief, the belief in a book and the and worship of a superhuman controlling power, gods or God. Um, that's what religion means here. And when we're talking about indigenous, we'll get into that later on. So I think this is a good segue to ask you. Um, can you tell us, can you tell the listeners, can you talk to us about your identity as a Sephardi Jew, indigenous to Israel, in addition to your identity as a Tewa woman, indigenous to the northern Rio Grande Pueblos? Um, so I come from the Sephardic people who ended up in diaspora here in New Mexico, as well as the Tewa people who are from the Northern Rio Grande Pueblos, as you mentioned. Um, this is a diaspora identity that we don't always talk about in Jewish spaces, but um, is very prevalent down here in the Southwest. And again, it's, it's something that can be challenging because um, identity is very granular in the space. And I think um, these generations, and, and right now we're in the space where we are openly talking about um, who we are without um, the same amounts of fear as previous generations may have had due to you know, oppression and violence and things that followed them um, from the Inquisition and whatnot. Um, so I am very fortunate to have both of these cultures and be a part of both of these tribes. Uh, I have spent a good amount of time in Israel and traveling and meeting um, you know, Jewish Sephardic communities all over the Mediterranean. Um, I spent a lot of time in public Jewish leadership, serving on boards for um, AJC, working with um, Israel Policy Forum, with Schusterman Foundation, uh, with a number of these groups. But it's very important for me to support leadership and um, support both of our, our tribal communities. Thank you. Beautiful. So given the UN definition of what it means to be indigenous and UN defines it as having collect collective identity, a self-identification as well as a collective identification. The reason a part of it I mentioned depression, um, a strong link to the territories, a connection to the land, um, and as well as maintaining that connection. So do you agree with this definition completely? And do Jews meet this criteria? And if so, how? So a couple of points to that that I think are very critical. Um, one, the land-based relationship is, for me as an Indigenous woman, the most important aspect of that definition. So my relationship with my homelands here in northern New Mexico, as well as our relationship as Jewish people with Israel, with Jerusalem, with our sacred spaces, um, are one of the most critical definitions of indigeneity. And so as Jewish people, our relationship to the, to the land is very pervasive in our religion and our holidays, um, you know, from the point where when we pray, we turn and face Jerusalem, right? Wherever we are in the world, wherever we are in diaspora, wherever, you know, historically we have been, this is something that Jews have done since we were forced into diaspora. So this is a, a relationship that has, you know, exceeded not only our, our boundaries, but, you know, across millennia of us being scattered uh, into different places. Um, secondarily, the relationship to the land regarding um, stewardship, um, our, our traditional life ways and food ways. Um, we talked uh, a, a little bit before this conversation about Tuba Shvat Seder and how, you know, when we eat all of the different foods from our land, these are very important mitzvahs for us as Jewish people to be connected to all of the, the things from where we come from. And when we return to Israel, and we have those things around us, you know, it feels, it very much feels like a homecoming um, because, you know, wherever we were in diaspora, we were always celebrating these things. 
one of the things that I think is missing from this UN definition is the fact that um, for indigenous people, we never became anything else. So as Tewa people, like, you know, the, we've had multiple waves of colonization here in New Mexico. We had the Spanish empire come. Um, we did not become Spanish. We had, you know, the American, the, the Mexican government <laughs> um, create a territory here. We are not Mexican. We had the American government come in and it's, it's a very, loose um, identification that tribal peoples are Americans. Like we have um, US citizenship, but we belong to our sovereign nations um, and to where we are from uh, first and foremost. So my, my homeland is, is Puebla, Wingue, San Alfonso Pueblo. Um, and for, for me, this is the most important space for me to contribute my time, my effort and my support um, similar like I feel very similar about Israel <laughs> and about supporting the Jewish people. Um, but for indigenous people, whoever you were, you did not become something else. Like you didn't adopt a national identity as your primary identity. Um, you didn't lose any connection to how your ancestors would have identified. Um, and also the ways in which you pray are not separate. Right. So as Jewish people, we pray in the same way that we would have prayed 3000 years ago. As as Tewa people, we pray in the same way we would have prayed 15,000 years ago. Um, yeah, we actually maintain that connection and maintain that identity. Yesterday, you mentioned a really amazing example of the Dead Sea Torah Scrolls, where if you take a Jew today and we can clearly read it and understand their language. And it's beautiful that, you know, we've revived our ancient ancient language. So I want to ask you, as a UN NGO representative and Indigenous rights advocate, would you say that Palestinians are Indigenous to the Lebanon, given this definition and how it's a work, how it's kind of a working definition, but also since Indigenous peoples are unique and not every Indigenous people are the same, what, what do you think about that? So I would say that we know that there were many other tribes from the Levant. Like, we, we don't have any conflict with that understanding. We know that there are layers to history. We have, you know, archeological, genetic, historical evidence. Um, these different groups have their own oral and written histories. But when it comes to the definition of indigenous peoples, again, if, if you identify as um, a national identity above your tribe, about, above who you were, then, then no, you do not fit a definition of indigenous peoples. If you, are practicing a religion that is not the religion that your people originally practiced, um, that does not fit a definition of indigenous peoples. And that's not to say that any of this is wrong. That's not to say that any of it is bad, that people don't feel connected to where they live, um, but they do not fit definitions of indigenous peoples um, and don't have a similar worldview, generally, generally speaking. Um, I would say also that in terms of nationalism and the Palestinian identity, there are a lot of heterogeneous waves of people who came through. And, and again, as, as Jewish people with our diaspora, we have our own heterogeneity, um, but at the core, we are all, you know, identify as, as Judean peoples. Um, we all practice the same religion and we all come, you know, relatively from this same place. Um, and I say relatively because I know that there are people who have come into our tribe um, and we do welcome them. So I don't want to make that exclusive in any way. But in terms of Palestinian families, if you know certain clans were to say, hey, look, we, we were Nabataeans, we are Ammonites, we are, you know, which, whichever tribes in the region. And then they were to say that, look, you know, we're we're practicing our ancestral traditions, we're practicing our ancestral land um, stewardship relationships, we're practicing all of these different things, then, then yes, that would identify. But I don't know personally, in my experience, families that identify in this way. And, and you know, there's, I think, a lot of pressure for them to identify in a more uniform, um, nationalistic way. And, you know, there's a lot of uniformity in Islam um, so I don't think that they fit uh, any standard definition of indigenous peoples. But that's not to say they're not from the region. Um, that's not to say that, you know, that they 
you know, weren't from some of the tribes that were there or that they, they weren't even Jewish people at one time. Um, we know a lot of those families were at one time, but, you know, when, when Arabs came and, and they became something else, they, they have a new identity and they are who they are now. Interesting. So you mentioned national identity. So I guess the next question is going to be about Zionism and the definition of indigenous and what it means to be indigenous and Zionism also has a national identity. So numerous definitions of indigenous hold that indigenous people must be oppressed or a minority. What are your thoughts on this phenomenon and what happens once indigenous peoples have achieved self determination? Zionism is a great example. Zionism is the first successful indigenous liberation. So how does that work after? Um, so do you want me to define Zionism first? Yeah. Okay. So, so for me, like the, the concept of Zionism just means tribal sovereignty. Um, for us as Jewish people, Zion is, is our ancestral homeland. And, you know, any, any like passion that we have to be there, to be in this space, to be sovereign and self-determining it within this space, uh, very critically has, um, a reflection on our cultural value system. The, the concept of a nation state, like a Western, um, defined nation state is, I don't think appropriate and when we come to the concept of Zionism. And we were, as the Jewish people, were very um, smart about how we pursued our uh, international recognition as a state and, you know, in preserving our own rights and creating rights for us as the Jewish people. Um, you know, it's, as you mentioned, it is one of the most successful indigenous liberation movements of all time. And it's, you know, absolutely incredible and miraculous <laughs> that we were able to do this as, as such a small people and like such a small space to have the international recognitions and relationships that we do. You know, it's, it's really a special thing. But for me, it's, it's completely an indigenous sovereignty movement. Zionism just translates to a love for our homeland, which, when I explain this to other indigenous peoples, they say, you know, do you love your reservation lands? Do you love where you come from? Like, yes, like you, you are have um, the same values as Zionism, like you are a Zionist, but this is just the Hebrew terminology because that's our language. This is how we refer to ourselves in our homeland. Um, I'm sorry, the next part of that question, please. <laughs> it was about oppression, how it's interesting that in many definitions of indigenous, oppression is almost required and it feels as though indigenous peoples are there's there's no hope for the future but it's literally in the definition and we see that zion as you said zionism is a uh, indigenous sovereignty movement a successful one so what happens do indigenous people stop becoming indigenous after we're not oppressed how that's so how i happen? i would challenge that and like we have we have a state right and to say that the Jewish people are not oppressed, maybe within the state of Israel, we don't face that similar oppression. But when you look at the region, when you look at, at our regional relationships, when you look at the BDS movement, when you look at international uh, viewpoints on, on just the existence of Israel, the existence of a Jewish state, like Jews having any space where we can be, you know, culturally viable on our own, like, I would really challenge that concept that, that we are not oppressed. Like no, no one wants us to have this. <laughs> no one wants us to be sovereign in our own space. And we are constantly fighting to legitimize our own reality. Um, so I don't think that that oppression has gone anywhere, to be honest. Um, and I think as indigenous people, when you have these dominant majorities, especially ones who are exerting like very stringent hegemonic powers, like regionally or globally, um, you're always going to be pushing back to have, you know, your own space and your own rights and to preserve what that space is. And I think as a Jewish people, we know this and we've invested in, you know, having uh, a, an incredible brain trust of, of legal minds, of policy driven minds, of, you know, foreign policy minds, um, so we are prepared for it. Not all indigenous peoples are prepared for that. And that has a lot to do with the fact that, look, we've been dealing with being forced um, out of our homelands 
in waves, right? Like we we were forced into Babylon, we came back. <laughs> we were forced uh, into global diaspora, we came back. Um, and this has been over thousands of years. And, and not only were we forced into global diaspora, but I can tell you from my own family's history, like we were driven out of Greece, we were driven out of Spain, we were, you know, forced out of Mexico City. Like, you know, we were, we were very quietly you know, here in northern New Mexico, because it just wasn't safe to be Jewish literally anywhere. So the, the concept of that oppression we've been dealing with as a Jewish people for thousands of years, for indigenous peoples within like the American continents, um, that, that context of external oppression has only been here since the point of contact, which is, you know, 500 years ago. And then in terms of our modern nation states, like the, the United States is only 250 years old. And so when you look at that, like that's not in the terms of, of history, like that's not that long of a time. So this is still something that, that they're dealing with newly and still trying to figure out ways that make sense for them culturally to pursue their own sovereignty, to pursue their own points past oppression. But also there have been incredibly limiting governmental um, issues for indigenous peoples within uh, the United States and Canada and, you know, across Latin America. I, I speak from the United States perspective because this is where I live and this is what I'm familiar with. Um, and what I deal with, you know, every day as a legislative advisor to our Pueblo governments. Um, but we are still dealing with these legacies of, us not having legally been allowed to practice our own religions until 1978, you know, our, our lands being seized and traded and, and taken and, you know, still to this day, um, you know, our, our sacred lands are fracked or our historical sites, which for us, you know, people will talk about like these, these cities that are ruins. And for us, these per our religious definition, these are still living our ancestors are still there and there's nothing gone. So if we really have freedom of religion, we're still you know, fighting for basic re recognition of that freedom of religion because it is not recognized. So these things are still very new within the past few decades to us. Um, and we're still like learning how it is culturally comfortable to exert that power and then building up those relationships um, with other supporters and other supporting um, communities, internationally, locally, na like nationally everywhere. <laughs> so I, I just don't think that the oppression ever leaves for indigenous people. And, and that's, you know, unfortunate and it's scary to think about maybe. Um, but it's also, we have the benefit of having a, a connected history, right? So, so most, most people who have a, a national identity, like they'll have started 200 years ago, they became American and, you know, they have 200 years of, of proud history. We have tens of thousands of years of this history for ourselves. And that's a privilege. That's a, a it's a burden and a privilege at the same time. Um, and we have to be thankful for that privilege and protect it. That's super interesting because when we think of oppression, we don't think a country can be oppressed, but really it's the Jewish people. And we can see that with the mass Elias from France or wherever in the world, just having the state of Israel is just a peace of mind, security, even though we're still constantly being threatened. So you mentioned early how, er, earlier how um, how it's important for indigenous peoples to you know, have, have allies. So how do you think Jews living in the diaspora as an indigenous people can cultivate an authentic and impactful relationship and allyship with other indigenous communities, especially Jews in the diaspora. So I think it's incredible that we're having these conversations about Jewish indigeneity now, because this is something that, as this is my diaspora experience and my di my natural experience as a Pueblo and Jewish woman, um, this is something I've always thought about and I've always understood and and lived um, within my life and, and my experience, but these conversations are just starting, they're becoming open. Um, and it's incredible to see other Jews learn about indigeneity, but we can't rush these things, right? It takes some time 
to understand how Indigenous communities function. It takes some time to understand ourselves as Indigenous people and to understand that there are Indigenous people from every continent, every skin color, every type of ethnicity, um, every like modern nation state has Indigenous people within it, um, has sovereign nations if, if those Indigenous people are fortunate to have those, those rights built up. Um, and if they don't, then they're fighting for them. So I think it's really important for us as a Jewish people to take this time to learn and to, to learn how those indigenous groups are functioning wherever we live in the world. Um, and not only that, but to spend some time learning about what their challenges are, what their challenges have been, because the histories of those indigenous groups, wherever you live, are not told. They are not something that you had in, in any kind of educational program about where, where it is that you come from. Um, these histories were intentionally erased and left out uh, so that you know, these groups didn't gain more power. And, and to be honest, um, indigenous groups just want to be viable and healthy and able to live our lives in our traditional ways in the places that we come from. So it's important for Jewish people to go into indigenous spaces very humbly to listen and to learn um, what can be challenging is other groups will come into indigenous communities and teach indigenous people about their experiences and say, hey, look, this is happening to you. This happened to us. You know, we're the same. And then there is a cultivation of that relationship that ends up exploiting, especially indigenous youth who are, who are very passionate and well-meaning um, and you know, intensely protective about indigeneity and other indigenous groups and, and pan-indigeneity. But it's really important that we as Jewish people are not taking anyone else's voice for our stories. We, we have strong enough voices <laughs> ourselves as Jews. You know, we're, we're very confident um, and loud about that. Um, and that's wonderful. And, and so, you know, it's really important that at this time, we build those relationships by listening and learning and supporting where we can, right? And I think when it comes to Indigenous values and Indigenous struggles, like, it, it just makes complete sense for us as Jewish people to be supporting that per partially because of our commitment to, commitment to tikkun olam, but also due to the fact that we're, we're humans living in this space and indigenous values are human values. They are ecologically like minded stewardship values. Like we all drink water. We all want clean water. Basically every indigenous group, wherever you live are fighting for clean water. Um, there are other significant issues regarding land exploitation and resources. And these are things that, ex that have significant impacts on biospheres um, that affect everything about our, our food culture, um, everything about how you're going to eat, how you're going to stay healthy in the place that you live. Um, these are not things that are exclusively, you know, should not be exclusively indigenous battles, but right now that they are, um, they can use support. So uh, I think the UN, the UN uh, statistics on indigenous people are that there are 5% um, of the global population uh, identify as indigenous and they have an 80% higher um, success rate at stewarding uh, natural spaces. So to think of that, like to put that in, in, in separate terms. So indigenous people, so 5% of the global population have a 400% higher success rate at protecting and, and ecologically stewarding um, natural spaces and biodiversity. So if we want to survive as a species, <laughs> if we want to you know, thrive as, as humans living on this planet as, as a part of nature, not separate from it, um, then we also need to be supporting indigenous spaces as well. So we can engage very authentically um, by not making things about us, by coming in and just learning where the work needs to be done and, and doing that work. And look, Jews are innovative and brilliant and talented. And there's so much that we can contribute to these spaces when we work in tandem with individuals who are from a region that have traditional ecological knowledge of that region. Um, so 
you know, I'm hopeful that, that these relationships just continue to grow. Yeah, and, and exactly. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but it's a process, not an allyship that can just come about. It's really has going to be work on the Jewish side coming in, listening. And to touch on what you said about when Indigenous people are on their land, we see that with Israel, how Israel was a desert and now it's flourishing. So my other question to you and for the listeners who are listening in now is, do you see any similarities between the Tewa people and indigenous people at large with the Jewish people? There are so many just deep, deep similarities. And again, as Pueblo people, we don't speak um, about most of our cultural or religious practices publicly. Um, And that's to do with just you know, a lot of traumas and forced colonization and and us keeping our sacred spaces and our sacred practices sacred, which means that they're not for everyone. It's for initiated people and they are for people who practice them um, as a whole system. So we don't speak about that. But I, I can tell you that even just looking at how we practice as Jews in terms of just the, the basic natural elements of our religion. We're, we're fire keepers. We do this every Friday. You know, the concept of mikvahs and ritual baths, like I'm, I'm very in love with <laughs> um, as an indigenous woman and, you know, as a Jewish woman, these are, these are very beautiful um, natural concepts that are the basis of our religion. When we look at the position of where our temple is on top of the mountain, the subterranean uh, location for the holy of the holy holiest of the holies the the ways that we identify with our foods with you know looking at um celebrations such as sukkot where you know we we have our plant medicines and we invite our ancestors in these are not metaphors these are ceremonies and for our ancestors these are very real ceremonies and when we connect to this we are connecting to all of those things. So when, when we're looking at the basis of who we are and our, our traditional practices, they are no different than other indigenous peoples throughout the world. You know, we have different names for things. We have like different approaches and regional practices, but when it comes down to it, you know, there are so many um, parallels, like our, our temples built on a mountain, all, all native people, <laughs> believe that mountains are secret, especially mountaintops for, for various reasons. Um, so when that comes down to it, that's, that's pretty critical, but also our kinship um, to one another and our relationships and community. The fact that we don't, we're, we're not supposed to be studying Torah independently, right? Like we, we study and we learn our culture together. We practice our culture together. We, you know, our, interrelated. We are um, dependent on one another. We are dependent on the place that we come from to survive. Um, and it's a, it's a really beautiful holistic system, but that's, that is indigeneity on, in and of itself. Like, and you know, whatever we might have lost in diaspora, or maybe we don't practice or honor in our day-to-day lives. Um, we can always, we can always find ways to connect with that if we choose to. Um, or we can understand that the system that we practice is an indigenous system, whether or not we, you know, wherever we're living or practicing that whole system or, or keeping all of those traditions alive. Right. And we see the term indigenous changes and but at, the, at the heart of it, it's an indigenous religion and mm-hmm. similar to every other indigenous religion. So whether it's the UN who defines it or there's other definitions at the end of the day, the Jewish people and other indigenous people have these connections to the land and practice these land-based religions. So I think that's super interesting. And another question for our listeners is, have you faced anti-Semitism in your community? And does it have to do anything with um, Israel or what? how was your experience? Um, so for me, I've experienced, I mean, I, I, I think all of us as Jews have our anti-Semitism experiences. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, there's a very significant amount of anti-Semitism in the Native American community, um, mm-hmm. as well as generally in indigenous communities. And that has to do with a lot of ignorance. Um, it has to do with how they were taught 
to think about Israel. Um, and when you think of indigenous people, we, we're not really on a political spectrum. Some, some people do identify as such, but realistically, when we look at the core of our, our cultural values, we don't fall into a Western political spectrum like left, right? Like this, this doesn't apply to us. You know, we have our own set of values, but they, they trend toward um, being pretty far left. And so in these leftist spaces, we know that these are incredibly anti-Semitic. Um, and again, these are teaching very, um, like teaching like young people who might not have international experience, might not have much of a, um, an outside worldview because they're focused on tribal, tribal issues, right? Because these, these are our day to day. We, we, we have our own news cycles. We have our own tribal concerns. We have our own in intro village issues. Um, so outside politics is secondary. World politics sometimes doesn't even make it in. So when that's involved in these leftist spaces, this is where they're learning. This is what they're learning. And it can be very, it can be very intense and problematic um, into how people are recruited into this mindset without understanding history of a region, without having experience with another culture. So it just ends up being um, a, a leftist American point of view when you know, Jewish people and culture and region and location are not American in any way or, or Western at all. So there's a lot of anti-Semitism um, in publicly identifying as a Jew in indigenous spaces. Um, but again, this is a, an educational issue. And this is something that can change pretty easily um, with relationship building, with, you know, person that citizen diplomacy, person to person diplomacy, um, with how we speak about our history and understanding how to speak about our history and understanding how indigenous people speak to each other about who they are and their identity. And that takes, again, just listening and learning. So I think right now there is going to be some discomfort for us as Jews in these spaces um, if we were to engage fully. But the only way that we change that is by engaging fully and by helping people understand like who we are and, and how deep our history is in the place and you know what our traditional religious practices are. I can tell you that every time I share something with my my husband's extended family that they don't know much about Jews. And so um, when we talk about these things, like they constantly say, oh, like this is this is the Indian way. This is this is how we do it too. And it's like, yes, I know this. <laughs> and that's why I'm sharing it with you in this way. And so they they immediately get it. Um, and there's a lot of respect. Like part of indigene indigeneity is respect for each other and respect for the world around us. Um, our, our animal relatives, our plant relatives, our, our um, mineral relatives, all, all everything around us, we have respect for and relationships with because it helps us to live. So when we approach each other, we try to maintain that same respect. So it, it will come, um, but right now it's, there's, there's a lot of just rhetoric um, an invitation for indigenous people into other spaces. And, and they're not always invited into Jewish spaces. They don't always see or meet Jews. So this is something that um, the more we engage, the more we're able to change. And it's also another challenge would be to overcome that already preconceived ideas about what it is, what Jews are and that rhetoric, that, that rhetoric, that anti-Israel rhetoric. So what do you think the best ways to overcome that rhetoric, the combating ideas that have already been in place? And you mentioned that left-wing connection, even though you know indigenous rights shouldn't have to do with politics and identity should be apolitical. Um, what, what do you think as, as Jews, on, especially Jewish students on campus, I'm sure they could relate to trying to make a bridge build with indigenous groups on campus, but they're already so closely linked to the Palestinian groups and it's harder for them. I have yeah. experienced this. So it, it's difficult, right? And especially when people are emotional and they respond emotionally to things and, and that can get um, very intense and passionate and, and everyone wants to be um, the champion and wants to be right. There's um, a wonderful foreign 
policy expert um, from Israel named Avi Melamed, and he talked. He wrote a book where he talks about um, everyone wants to be the knight that slays the dragon that like saves like the people, and so everyone is is out there in these political spaces or in these like on campus dialogues, you know, trying to be that that knight saving the people and fighting that dragon, and that dragon is personified often as as, as Israel or the Jewish people, and and. It, it doesn't need to be. So when they're in those spaces, one of the things that I like to do to diffuse a lot of that emotional response is to ask a lot of questions. And so um, depending on, on where I am with the person, depending on, you know, how like, like if it's a group conversation, if it's a public conversation, um, I might ask questions such as, at what point does a group of people become indigenous to a place? And, and the answer to that for me as an indigenous person is you don't become indigenous to the place. You're indigenous to where you came from and to where your people had a relationship um, and to where you know, your ancestors developed their language around based on the world around them. That's where you are indigenous to, regardless of where you are now, regardless of how many generations you've changed. But at what point does a group become indigenous to a place? At what point does a group stop being indigenous to a place? And you only stop being indigenous to a place when you accept another identity or you become, you know, another, um, you become that other identity. So these are the two questions that I think are, are pretty critical for, for some of these conversations, but even just asking who people are, because they'll say, you know, Jews are colonizers, Jews are European. It's like, well, like, do you understand that, that Jews come from like the Swana Middle Eastern region? Like, do you understand like, like that, you know, Jews ended up in a lot of different places that the media may only portray a certain perspective, or you might have only learned about this one type of Jew, but there are many different types of Jews. And it, it really, you know, brings down a lot of that emotional response because they don't know these things. Or even asking like, who, who are the Palestinians? You know, who, who are Arabs? Where, where do Arabs come from? Where is Islam from? Like where, you know, when did that come into that region? How did those tribes identities change into what they are now and do those people still identify with who they were who built Jerusalem who you know like who lives there now a lot of different people live there now and we're not trying to dispute that a lot of different people should live there now like we we know that they do like we know that we have respect for each other on a one-on-one -on -one basis like I don't get in fights with my Palestinian friends like <laughs> like our uh activist spaces do with with each other and like I don't have these issues these are a lot of it is for me American dialogue um and, and yes we have disagreements politically or socially or you know based on on what um on uh, uh like political power needs but when it comes down to it like we respect each other we know that we're you know and, and this is an intertribal relationship and an intertribal conflict um we know that you know from the region like we're we're not going to get better we're not going to build peace unless we are trying to respect one another and make sure that all of our families can succeed and thrive in the place that we are i think it's just a lot of uh trying to diffuse the emotional response right thank you i think we have some questions now from our high school students oh excellent so I see we have some students here, Mordechai. Hi. Ask your question, Marina. Thank you for uh, taking my question. I'm Mordechai Olsen. I'm a grade 12 student at Orchaim in Toronto and I'm a Hasbara fellowship, high school fellowship um, intern. So I was just wondering, most of my friends, have, most of my Jewish friends have never heard of this concept of being an indigenous people. So what would be the easiest way to explain it to them? Um, gosh, <laughs> it, it's... Uh... It's an interesting thing that we as Jews, um, and I've said this earlier in many different ways, but we as Jews did not adopt outside identities, right? Like we, we weren't a tribe of people that became Christian and like stayed that way and then became, you know, French. Like that the, whoever, whoever the French people were before, they became something else. We as Jewish people have always been Jews. We pray in the same way our ancestors prayed. We acknowledge our relationship to our homeland in the same way that our ancestors did. Um, but one of the things that we had also talked about earlier in this interview is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So 
seeing those in like the Israel Museum, you go and you look at them and you can read most of it, right? An average Jew in Israel has the capability to access any, any of our ancestral um, materials and understand the context and understand like what the language, um, understand what that means and, and understand how that applies to them today and now. So the concept of us being indigenous people and connected to all of that is probably the easiest way to identify our indigeneity, um, but also to explain to them that look, you know, wherever they are in, you know, in, in Canada, you're going to be looking at those local tribes and, and they're very different from you. And they have very different culture and practice. So I also understand a lot of people are not immediately understanding what their relationship to that is, but every continent, every country um, in the entire world has indigenous peoples, every skin color, every ethnicity. Um, and it's really important that we talk about that, that there are indigenous peoples all over the place and not just where we are, right? And, and to point out the fact that yes, the indigenous peoples in the place that you live are very different from you because they're indigenous to that place and you are indigenous to somewhere else. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, um, hi, my name is Rina. I'm a Hasbara High School intern. Um, my question was, does being Ashkenazi Sephardic or Mizrahi have anything to do with Jewish indigenous status? So I don't believe that it does. These are all diaspora identities that we acquired um, and we built and, you know, we were we were forced to assimilate into different places. Um, we were forced to look at our religion through different cultural lenses. Uh, these are all part of our history, but they're not to do with our indigeneity. Our indigeneity has to do with our relationship with Israel and our relationship to each other as Jews. And, and now we have this very complex history and these complex identities, but at the core, like you, we're, we're, all Jews, like you're Jewish, I'm Jewish, like we're related, like we're sisters, like this is um, something that goes back well before your family became Ashkenaz and my family became Sephardic. Great, thank you. You're welcome. That's really beautiful. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Eliana, a high school fellow. Eliana, go ahead. Hi, I'm Eliana. I go to Hebrew Academy High School of Montreal. And I was wondering if you constantly have to explain yourself to people, even to Jews, how you're both Jewish and Native American and how you as a Jewish person are indigenous. So the answer to that is yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and what gets to be really interesting is a lot of people make up, um, rather than asking me, a lot of people will make up reasons why I'm Jewish and native and bring up the fact like, oh, she's, she's half and half or she's this and that, or like one of her parents was this and one of her parents is that. And it's like, no, this is, this is my diaspora identity. And I have to explain to them, like, look, like I'm a, I'm an indigenous Jew, I'm a native American Jew. And this is no different than being a Russian Jew or a Polish Jew or a Libyan Jew or an Ethiopian Jew <laughs> or any other ad diaspora identity that we may have. Um, and when it comes down to the fact that I am ethnically Jewish and ethnically Native American, you know, we don't talk a lot about the fact that everywhere we, we ended up in diaspora, we were in small communities and we necessarily had to mix with local populations and Jews from wherever they're from look or wherever they're from look like those places. Um, they have a lot of those characteristics and you know, we have a lot of those cultural aspects. So mine is just uh, a diaspora identity <laughs> that people don't um, always hear about because you know where where I come from it's it's pretty quiet um, we're pretty private and overall you know there's still a lot of holdover um, holdover attitudes coming from the Inquisition which you know is only like a hundred years away from where we are now. Um, a lot of holdover attitudes from people having learned about the the conflict in different ways. So again, it's a it's a pretty quiet diaspora identity, but it is something that I do have to explain as well as how as Jews we are indigenous because as Jews we haven't had these conversations collectively um, in recent times. 
It's something that is a new and evolving conversation in Jewish spaces, talking about our indigeneity, understanding what indigenous means, um, which most people do not. <laughs> understanding what what it means to be part of indigenous spaces or these global indigenous spaces or how to relate to other indigenous groups which when we sit down and we we listen and we we speak to them we understand that their experiences are really not dissimilar to our own so this is all fairly new in our our community dialogues um so i i understand that and i, I have some patience with it and I'm very thankful that these conversations continue to evolve. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you to our high school fellows for such amazing questions. And thank you, Marina, for joining us and enlightening us and teaching us. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Isabella and Marina. That was truly fascinating. Here at Hasbara, we strongly believe in educating others about this notion of Jewish indigeneity because it directly negates the falsehood used by anti-Israel activists that Jews do not have a relationship or a claim to Israel. As historical, archeological, and genetic evidence all attest, Jews are indeed an indigenous people. This argument also explains Zionism and why the Jews sought to return to our homeland to begin with, because we have always maintained that Israel is where we became a people and is fundamental to our identity as a people. Given that there are a lot of misconceptions about this topic, unfortunately, even in the Jewish community today, I implore all of you to read more about why Jews are an indigenous people. I highly recommend a tablet magazine article titled, Are Jews Indigenous to the Land of Israel? Yes. It is now my honor to introduce the first of two sets from Ta'ir, the lead singer of the Israeli music trio, Ewa. Hi everyone at Hasbara, I'm Ta'ir Chaim, the lead singer and founder of the group Ewa, and currently I'm working on my solo project that also mixes Yemenite music with modern beats. Beside me is Michal Meital on the guitar, uh, we, before the pandemic, we played all over the world, and right now we are broadcasting to you from Michael's studio in Tel Aviv, and we will start off with Dero Ikra. Dero Ikra Oh, my God. 
Thank you. Israeli culture is a beautiful melting pot. You can hear the diversity in the Israeli music and you can taste it in the Israeli food. My grandparents immigrated from Yemen to Israel and they brought a wonderful tradition of music and poetry. One of the songs that I really love is Ayala Thhen. It was written by the great poet Shalom Shabazi. And it is a song that we usually sing at weddings. It talks about the strong connection between a man and his wife as a metaphor for the connection between God and the people of Israel. Oh 
you so much. And the next song is Habib Galbi, Love of My Heart and My Eyes, Who Turned You Against Me? It's a song that completely changed my life. Um, one day I just had this idea to record um, a version, a modern version for this song. So together with my Ewa sisters, we took this ancient song and turned it into a worldwide hit. Habib Galbi.
Good afternoon. I'm Robert Walker, Director of Special Projects for Husborough Fellowships Canada. It's so great to be here with you. I'm very excited to tell you about a project you may have heard a little bit about, but you'll be hearing a lot more about in the coming weeks. And of course, that's Many Languages, One Message. And this is a really great, truly unique opportunity that we've introduced, which is taking some of the most impactful, some of the most persuasive pro Israel messages out there and translating into some of the most common, most widely spoken languages in the world. These are Mandarin in Chinese, Hindi, Japanese, Russian, Arabic, uh, and these language campaigns are going to be introduced both virtually and hopefully as soon as possible into physical campaigns that will be able to be produced and shared in universities, colleges, and high schools alike, so stay tuned, we're really excited about that. Hi, my name is Yessi, and I'm Husborough Fellowships Canada's campus advisor. And my role is to work with students on college and university campuses all across Canada. In a normal situation, we'd be taking our students to Israel, where they receive intensive Israel advocacy training for a period of 16 days, where they actually get to see what is happening on the ground, meet with key players such as politicians, um, activists, Palestinians, uh, Arab Israelis and um, Jews of all different backgrounds and get to experience for themselves what is actually happening on the ground. Since the start of the pandemic, we shifted our training to an online platform through Israel Engage. Uh, and this time around, this, it has been our second Israel Engage program. And we're very excited to welcome in our new Hasbro fellows who are as determined as ever to continue to advocate for Israel online and on campus. Hi, I'm Pearl and I am the high school advisor for Hasbro Fellowships Canada. A few years ago, we realized that uh, we could reach even more students and reach them earlier if we start reaching out to students while they're still in high school and start providing them with some of the training and advocacy skills that they'll be able to use while they're in high school, sometimes in school and often on social media. And so that when they get to campus and get to be YESI students, they're even more prepared and ready to go in as leaders from day one and really know how to how to advocate on campus. So the way that our program works is it's pretty much all virtual. Um, we have students across Canada and even some in the United States this year and we have monthly webinars uh, with different guest speakers on topics that are important for the students to learn about such as the United Nations, social media use, media bias, and many more. And in addition, the students also work on specific tasks throughout the year in order to get to put the skills that they're learning into practice and really know how to advocate in a very practical way. Hi, my name is Rhoda Singer, and I'm a proud member of the board of Hasbro Fellowship of Canada. As we are all sadly aware, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel discrimination has definitely risen to new heights. On many of our college and university campuses, Jewish students are being targeted. They can either put their head down and just walk away, or they could go ahead and stand tall and show fellow students, and unfortunately some teachers, that there is no truth in this vicious, and they're in the vicious words and in their vicious thoughts. Hasbara gives these students the training necessary to stand up for themselves and own their own Jewish identity, as well as be proactive and teach other students that there is nothing sinister about Israel or Zionism. It is simply the Jewish homeland. Our mission is simple, to give our student leaders the training and the confidence necessary to change the world. Thank you and have a great day. Hello. My name is Vivian Gray Siner, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today on behalf of Hasbara Canada. I'm proud to be recognized in, as an outspoken human rights activist. I'm involved and have been for a long time fighting many injustices and human rights abuses around the world. I'm proud to have helped many peoples regardless of their religious beliefs, their country of origin, the color of their skin, or their political ideologies. But nothing is more important to me than the well-being and support of Jewish youth on campus and off. 
Nothing is more important to me than helping Jewish youth learn to reclaim their pride, to be proud of their her heritage, to be proud of their culture, to be proud of being Jewish and proud of the state of Israel, the Jewish national homeland. This is not at all as easy as it might sound. To be a proud Jew on campus, to be a Zionist on campus, to support Israel on campus in 2021 means being open to condemn condemnation, derision, rejection, demonization, to being doxxed, to being canceled. It's very frightening and alienating and isolating unless you have support and guidance and information and Hasbara Canada does all that and more. It's expensive to train students, but there is no better return on your investment as a proud Jew than to help Hasbara continue and flourish. Every student we train puts another nail in the coffin of ideologies that lie, that hurt, and that undermine the Jewish people's very existence. Thank you. Am Yisrael Hai. Bye. It is now my honor to introduce our next session, Supporting Israel in the Black Community. This session will be moderated by our Hasbara campus advisor, Max Mendel. Max? Thank you so much, Daniel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Supporting Israel in the Black Community with Joshua Washington. I'm your moderator, my name is Max, and I am the Southeast Regional Advisor for Hasbara Fellowships. Joshua Washington is the director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. He's 28 years old and a composition graduate of the University of Pacific's Conservatory of Music. Joshua was formerly IBSI's director of special events and planned music performances featuring the Hebrew project artists across the country. Joshua is also a graduate of Christians United for Israel's 2016 Diversity Outreach Mentoring Endeavor, where he received training in Israel advocacy for diverse audiences. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Max. And I, I got to update my bio because it says I'm 28. I'm actually 30 now, so I got to <laughs> do a couple of uh, edits on there. But I appreciate you. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Of course. Thank you so much for joining. Um, first, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what led you to do the impactful work that you do now. Sure. So about myself, um, like you were just reading, I, my background's in music and I've always, uh, my, my parents have raised us to have this affinity, this deep affinity for uh, the Jewish community and, and for the Jewish roots of our faith. So I'm, I'm a Christian and I was raised Christian. Um, and um, we've always uh, had this, like I said, this appreciation for the roots of our faith. And it, when I went to college was when I was first confronted with um, anti-Israel sentiment and anti um, At the time, my college wasn't very, wasn't vicious like some other colleges, you know, across country, but there was, um, I was first kind of confronted with uh, during one of the Gaza wars and there was very, very much one narrative that was being put out there which was just that Israel was attacking Gaza and for no reason and Palestinians were dying and and um, I didn't really know what to do and it's different I think from my Jewish friends because obviously sometimes for some of them they, they're targeted on campus because they are Jewish and I wasn't Jewish so people weren't targeting me but I did feel like I needed to say something um, because I didn't seem right and so that was when I started to do my own, do some research, talk to my father who, who founded Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel uh, just a few years later and um, got some more information and started just having conversations with, with people on campus. Like, why do you feel that way? Why do you say that? Um, okay, well, did you know that Israel does this? Did you know that little things that no one on campus knew? Like, did you know that Israel sends leaflets, you know, to Gaza to let Palestinians know that they're coming and, and try to, lead civilians to safety. Like, you know, there are things that when I started finding them out, I just felt this kind of burning desire to like, to share it because it seemed like people were just speaking on things that they had no idea 
about. Um, and so that kind of transformed into, after I graduated, um, really being a part of Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel um, as one of the, as the special events coordinator. So I was in putting the music together for events that we would do. Um, and then that turned into um, me being the assistant director and actually doing more speaking and writing articles. And then just last year, my dad made me the, the executive director. So now I'm, I'm over Ipsy, um, you know, run the events, still do the music, but, but a lot more on the speaking side and the writing and, and advocating and things like that. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really awesome to work with the Jewish community, to learn what I've been learning, to be able to go to Israel and also to see how um, a strong relationship between the Jewish people and the black people um, is beneficial for, for my community as well. And so all those things have been really, really great for me. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, thank you for all the hard work that you do. Um, it is so incredibly important and impactful. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more about what the Institute for Black Sol um, Solidarity does and, and what its mission is. Absolutely. So uh, Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, we are first and foremost, uh, our primary goal is education. So we've noticed um, the reason why Ipsy was formed was out of this noticing that there is a, a vacuum of education um, in the black community when it comes to the Jewish community. Um, Anti-Semitism in the black community isn't, isn't majority, it isn't the majority in the black community, but the, the loudest voices, unfortunately, um, are the ones that are doing the most damage and going unchallenged. And so Ipsy is there to challenge those voices um, and also to fill that void with, with really the truth about Israel and Jewish people, because unfortunately the, the void has been filled um, by people who have nefarious um, who, who ha have nefarious um, goals for the Jewish people, people who, who are Jew haters. You know, there have been people, everyone from New Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam to the, the Black Hebrew Israelite movement. Um, they, they, uh, they rise on the fact that whether, uh, whether it's biblical literacy, a lot of Black Christians don't know their scriptures or just um, being ignorant of history of the Jewish people and of Israel. Um, and they tell their own narrative and they twist facts um, and they do it in a way that, that in, really inspires people to want to take up a cause against the Jewish people. And so Ipsy is there to, to push against that, but to also replace that with accurate information and with, with, with the truth about um, the history of the Jewish people and, and, and Israel and all those things. So, um, so that's our main goal is education. So, so you mentioned Louis Farrakhan. Um, He's a vile mm -hmm. anti-Semite um, and has, like you mentioned, has received a lot of support from mainstream celebrities. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do to educate others, especially within the black community, listening to him um, that, you know, Farrakhan is in fact promoting hatred and bigotry. Right. So we believe at Ipsy that, that education is, is the, the strongest tool that we can use against anti-Semitism um, in the way that, not just um, defends Israel and the Jewish people, but actually kind of turns the tables on the, the, those who are spreading lies. So for instance, you know, Louis Farrakhan is a rabid anti he, he's a rabid Jew hater. He has, over these past few decades, he has said some very egregious things about the Jewish community um, and his followers and his, his acolytes are, are just taking up that mantle and, and continuing on with that, one of the things that, that we do at Ipsy is not just break down why uh, what they're saying about the Jewish people are lies and, and hateful. We turn, we turn the narrative to say that, you know, Louis Farrakhan has influence around the world and his influence has actually led to the enabling uh, of slavery in Libya and, 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 and Muammar Gaddafi. This is one of the, one of the one of the more periphery things that, that um, I do uh, along with Ipsy, but with other partners is we, we expose um, African slavery, what's going on in, in different Arab countries. And unfortunately, um, Louis Farrakhan has actually had a hand in some of those uh, in covering up some of those things. He completely stood in front of a camera and, and lied like bold faced lie about 
uh, Sudan and said that there was zero slavery going on in Sudan. And he said, if you think there's slavery, then you need to go check for yourself, which is exactly what some of these people did. And when they confronted him about it, he, he hasn't said anything about it since then. Um, and so, not, so showing them that not only is he wrong about the Jewish people, but he, he acts as though the nation of Islam is the answer to the, to the black community when it actually is, is oppressing and enabling the oppression of Africans. So it's actually the problem. Um, so it's those things, I think, that, that um, push, not just push back on the narrative, but actually turn the tide the opposite way to show people that, you know, um, we need to know the truth about what's being said, but also the truth about who is saying these things. So, yeah. um, in, the fight to, in the fight against discrimination, Black Americans and American Jews share profound and enduring common interests. I have loved reading your op-eds, you know, over the last couple of years. Um, you really highlight how the Black and Jewish struggle have been intertwined in America. Um, could you elaborate to our listeners today about these shared interests and struggles? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I love talking about this too. When I think about the Black and Jewish relationship, um, for me, it goes back to the early 1900s, the 1910s, 1920s with Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, which to me, I think, to me, I think it's really a symbol for, for black Jewish um, camaraderie was that, you know, Booker T. Washington was an educator. He was a very, very influential, um, sometimes controversial, but <clears throat> um, pioneer in education in the, in the black community, founded the Tuskegee, um, Tuskegee University, um, was a president for a while as well. And he had written several books and um, Julius Rosenwald had picked up one of his books and was inspired by it and reached out to him. Julius Rosenwald was a successful businessman. He was the owner of, uh, but um, uh, worth a lot of money. And he reached out to Booker T. Washington and told him that he wanted to uh, build a school for, for African-Americans time. Um, you know, black people couldn't learn in, in white schools. And T. Washington said, well, let's not just build one school, let's, let's build tons of schools. So they wound up building over 5,000 schools together. Wow. Um, and those schools were so good that it spawned a generation of successful, um, intelligent um, black people. lawyers came out of that school, politicians came out of that school, engineers, doctors came out of that school going on to great colleges um, and, and actually being successful people. And so to me, um, that's not a small thing. I mean, we're still, you know, I, I'm sitting here today, able, I'm able to discuss these things with you in part because of what was done back then, that the door that was open for the black community because Julius Rosenwald um, empowered Booker T. Washington to actually uh, fulfill his vision for the black community. Um, and then you go to fast forward to Martin Luther King um, and his profound relationship to the Jewish community. You know, he, he pulled no punches. He was very pro-Israel. He, he had a very close relationship with, with rabbis and, and he often would talk about how there's, there is, you know, unfortunately there was a rising tide of anti-Semitism from the black community then, and he spoke to it then um, to say that one is that it comes from um, being color consumed is what he calls it. And he said that, you know, we, we tend to see, you know, some of us, in the, some of the more radical people in the, in the civil rights struggle tend to see anyone who's white as being bad, anyone as, as colored as being good. Um, and he was just like, no, we reject that. I mean, we, you, have to, um, you have to call out injustice when you see it, but it, it has nothing to do with, with the color of somebody's skin. Um, and, and his partnership with the Jewish community is what led to one of his closest confidants forming an organization called Black Americans Supporting Israel Committee, just a few years after Dr. King was assassinated, Bayard Rustin formed an organization called Black Americans Supporting Israel Committee and had over 200 different signatures on there. Everyone from Rosa Parks to Coretta Scott King to um, Hank Aaron, so he had athletes, he had, he had musicians, um, he, had, he had politicians and all those things who were in support of Israel, but also um, understanding that um, as the uh, un understanding that uh, supporting Israel was not just some faraway thing, but how uh, how what was happening on a on a international level with Arab nations, you know, 
um, coercing other countries to break ties with Israel and using oil to as, as leverage, how that also affected the working class black American who with if gas, you know, that would up the gas and that would actually hurt us, you know? And, and so they were seeing how a relationship with Israel was actually good for black Americans on the ground as well as the Jewish community that was living in their communities at the time. So there was this synergy that was there. And I think anytime the black and Jewish community work together, there's real forward movement that happens for us. You know, there are Jewish people who, who fought and died um, for our civil rights. You know, the Jewish people who, who risked their lives um, alongside us in, in our struggle for, for uh, equality and our struggle for, for civil rights. So there's, there's real forward movement there. And I think that if, when we can get back to that um, on, a, on a bigger scale, we can continue to move forward, our, both of our communities can. So. I remember learning about the civil rights movement when I was younger and being so inspired by seeing, you know, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel standing mm. side by side with Martin Luther King Jr. Um, yeah. during the civil rights movement. And, and it really shows, like you said, how important um, and powerful things are when, mm. uh, when injustice is being called out everywhere and we're, we're all coming together to fight, you know, this mm. shared uh, really important value, fighting injustice. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Um, so just to take a step back when we were talking about um, incidences of uh, anti-Semitism coming from um, the black community, uh, we, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, with Nick Cannon. Um, mm -hmm. There was an incident with him. Um, and since then he has, you know, worked hard to educate himself and, and, uh, and go back on his wrongdoings. I wanted to just get your opinion on that. Do you think that in this sort of example, he did everything he can um, to, uh, to be forgiven? And I, you know, I, I'm someone who, who definitely sees cancel culture as, as being toxic, uh, um, but, and forgiveness is important. And at the same time, anti-Semitism is more <laughs> rampant than ever here and uh, people need to be held accountable. So I just wanted to get your opinion um, on, on Nick Cannon and sort of how you see these examples and what forgiveness should look like. Sure, sure. So I think that um, that's a great question. So I honestly think that, so Nick Cannon specifically, um, I've been kind of following his, his non-celebrity, like his more political stuff, um, probably for just off and on, just some from stuff he's posted, maybe maybe like 10 years and seeing him speaking out on some things and some things I agreed with him on, some things I didn't agree with him on. I think to me, Nick seems like um, someone who's an honest thinker. So even so if there, if meaning like if he's wrong, he'll be like, okay, I was so wrong about this. Sorry. And I think that um, really the, the pull that, that fair the, the that Farrakhan line of thinking, that Nation of Islam line of thinking has, it's a very strong pull. And if you are an intellectual who really wants to like know the truth about what's going on with things, and you don't have a, a sort of mentor or anything like that, it's it's easy to get sucked into that stuff. You know, um, it's easy to um, you know start like just think, okay, well, you know, maybe maybe it is the Jews that control everything. Maybe it is a, even though that's a lie, um, that, that's why that's why I mean that's that's why it's so dangerous that there's a vacuum of education because Nation of Islam hasn't hasn't just they have not only been successful in spouting lies but they really do take people under their wings. So it's like Farrakhan is like a father figure to a lot of people, you know, he's like a grandfather figure to a lot of people. And so, mm -hmm. whereas even if people even if there there are some people who follow him who don't necessarily agree with his statements about they'll never sense them because they, they would feel like they're betraying, you know, their father. And so I think with Nick, um, I think that even though he was completely and totally in the wrong, that he, he didn't intend to, his intention wasn't to lie on the Jewish people's intention. He thought he was doing something good. And when he was called out for it, um, and he, he had made his initial apology the the response from many people in the black was appalling. I mean, there are people who are really tearing him apart, even people that he's had on his show. So there are people that he brought on previously 
who were just publicly condemning him and humiliating him for apologizing because they were saying him he was you know dancing for his puppet masters and he was a slave and all these things and this is this is where i commend him he could have easily kind of caved and turned back around because there was so much pressure on him to not apologize or to take back his apology right. um and he's still in the his own community you know disowning him he said no, no 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 what i said was wrong it was completely wrong should not have said it um had a rabbi on a show to talk about it and and has done some and as well, I, I think honestly, he's he's taking a taking a great step. He, he's in, he's going in the right direction. Um, I don't think that um, I've never been a believer of someone being in debt forever. So like, I, I do think that there is a point where okay, he he's like he's forgiven, like it, he's sincere. He's he's endured ridicule from his own people, and he's still standing firm. And and he's also doing he's actively doing things to actually show that he's he doesn't think that way anymore. Um, you know, I still disagree with them on, on some other things he says, but to me, that's, that's the sign of someone who's an honest thinker who, you know, I, I would like, I mean, I wouldn't liken him to this person, but uh, in the same way, you know, um, you know, in the later years of Malcolm X's life, he talked about how black people need something like Zionism. He said, you know, that there's Zionism is self-determination of Jewish people. We need to look to the Jewish people and, and learn from them. Like we need to do that for ourselves. And I believe in that same way, if, if, and at that same time, he was calling out um, some of the corruption within the nation of Islam, you know, and the sexual misconduct and all those things. And he said, he said himself, like, I don't know, if, I, I think my life might be in danger, but I have to say these things. I think that Malcolm falls in that same category of being an honest thinker was, I think that if he had had the opportunity to live longer, we may have seen him actually have a complete 180 on on Jews and Israel, you know, we might have actually seen him make some positive statements about the Jewish state um, because he wasn't, um, he, didn't, he didn't have an agenda to, you know, disenfranchise or talk down about anyone. He was, he was honestly trying to f figure out, you know, what the truth was in any situation. So I, I would say Nick Cannon is that kind of person. Um, and I, I hope that, that even though there was a lot of pushback against him in our own community, well, my, my prayer was that a lot of black people actually looked into the, some of the things that he was saying, they actually watched the interview with the rabbi and learned some new things. Um, I think he even had Barry Weiss on his show. Like they actually would learn some things about what she was saying and, and what she was saying in her book. Um, and I, I, I was glad that he used his platform to turn that around. So I'm happy about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, we, we discussed in your bio, you, you, you have a, back, a strong background in, in music. And I wanted to know if you were ever able to intertwine, you know, two passions of yours, music and uh, supporting Israel. Yeah, so I've been doing music all my life. And as far as intertwining goes, I think the, the, more, the, the most intertwining that's happening right now is that um, my, my father and I are finishing up an album with a group that he, that he started called The Hebrew Project. And um, it's, it's uh, you know, gospel jazz and, you know, some other, other genres are in there mixed in with some traditional Jewish songs to other originals that he and I both written and some reggae that's in there. Um, we have a single that's out right now called Oh Jerusalem. And um, I think that that um, it really is, is, when my dad started the group, he wasn't thinking about it on this level, but it's, it has become really a, like a black Jewish solidarity kind of thing because you know, we've done a lot of events. We've played at churches, we've played at synagogues. We've, we've done things with, in conjunction with other organizations. So we've had other cantors come and sing with us and um, all those different things. And, and um, when, when that album is finished, um, there's going to be, and also when we're able to do more in-person events. Um, the, the, the plan is to do these Ipsy events, but also fuse music into there as well. So I, I'm a singer and songwriter and um, I would love to come and, and share a couple of our songs in addition to, you know, speaking about Black Jewish solidarity. And I, I think that it's, music is extremely powerful um, and, and, you know, beautiful music can really move people in a way that words can't. Um, you know, I, my, my most, the, the most memorable experience I've ever had um, uh, at, a, at an event was, was a concert, you know, and, and the singer only say, said a few things in between songs. I don't even remember what she said, I just remember 
you know, what was, what was sung and what was the music that went forth. And I think coupling that with our advocacy will really um, move, move hearts as well as kind of like transform people's minds as they're like learning these new things. So, yeah. That's awesome. And, and really inspiring how you're able to take two, uh, two things that you're passionate about and mm. uh, intertwine them and together, you know, that comes out and, and uh, really does a lot of impactful work for the community. So um, those are all the questions I have at this time. Um, we have a lot of amazing students that will be joining us and they have lots of questions. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're able to give them that time so they can ask questions. They're the ones that are on campus. So at this time, we are going um, to some amazing student leaders uh, on campus who, are, who have some questions for Joshua. So Talia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Talia Meyer. I'm a student at Okanara. I'm thankful to be a Hasbara High School intern this year. And my question for you is, is there a way that we can use the recent peace treaties in the Middle East to advocate for Israel in Black communities in North America and especially on campus? Hi, Ty, thank you for your question. That's a great question. Um, I, I absolutely, I believe that we can. Um, first of all, because one of the one of the one of the accusations you know that's thrown at Israel is that you know there will never be peace in the Middle East um, because of Israel, and so we're seeing that that's actually that's not true because there are Arab countries that are making peace with Israel. Not only that, but Israel is normalizing ties with other African countries as well, um, and to show. Um, I think this was this is a perfect opportunity to one to kind of highlight some certain some, some certain things. And one of those things is um, some of the Arab leaders who have been criticized for making peace with Israel have said that you know they've actually said that okay, Palestinians, your your main problem is Hamas. Like you guys need to you guys need to like figure out how to get out of there, and you guys can have a better life. Well, I think it's per it's a perfect opportunity for for the Zionist community to actually like expound on that. Like, what do they mean by that? How is Hamas a big problem for them? Um, how are Palestinians oppressed? And what's hampering, what's hampering them from making peace with Israelis? Um, I think that's, that's a great, not just Hamas, but he just said your leaders in general, like what is, what is actually hampering them from making peace with Israel? Um, and how can we, how can, how can that be turned around? Um, I think that's an important um, issue to talk about. Um, and, he, and then you can even link it all the way back to the, just the fact that, you know, Palestinian leaders and, and, and past Arab leaders have, you know, manipulated Palestinians, um, you know, into uh, hating Israel, to um, leaving their land so that they could try to uh, remove uh, the Jews from the land, all those things. Like, it's, I think it's a good piece now, that conversation, to, to show that, no, it's not just tired you know, just spouting out that these are true things. And now the Arab leaders are actually finally admitting it. So I, yeah, I, th I think that's one of the ways. And I think the other way is just, <clears throat> I think to, to highlight what Israel can do for these other countries and what, what, a, what a mutually beneficial relationship can do for Israel and for these countries, um, how they can help these countries reach a better life, like a better potential. And even with, like I said, with some of the African countries as well, like the resources that Africa has um, and Israel's technology and, the, and them actually telling and teaching them how to use the resources they have, how that actually benefits um, the whole, that whole area, the whole continent of Africa and, and for the Arab states as well. So yeah, I think we can use it to our advantage for sure um, to actually tell the truth and, and, um, and get, the, get the word out in a much bigger way than before. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. And uh, it looks like we have another question from a student, Sarah. Sarah, if you would like to introduce yourself first, that would be great. Yeah, hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I go to Tannenbaum Chat and I am a Hasbro High School intern. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So my question is, as a Jewish student, what can I do to help build bridges between the black and Jewish communities so we can eradicate hatred on both sides? Absolutely. Um, so that's a great question. I think the first thing is, one, 
and I, I kind of mentioned this to Max, but I can answer a little bit more, is that, um, you know, on campus, there are, it's just, unfortunately, there is, you know, there's always all, all problems on campus. There's, there's anti-Semitism on campus. You have other tensions just because you have a bunch of students, kids together in one place. And that means there'll be, there'll be issues there. And I think that <clears throat> one of the ways that, that um, the black students and Jewish students can, can come together, I think is really by, um, you know, a, there has to be a relationship that's built first before there can be an allyship. You know, allyship really is born out of relationships. Um, you can't really have allyship without a relationship. You can try, but if there's not already something that's a foundation there, then anything can kind of break it apart. And so what I mean is, <clears throat> so those students on campus that you might know um, that maybe, you know, maybe they're, they're not a part of the other uh, anti-Israel groups on campus, or they're just, they're just students, they may be in your class or whatever, actually like just reaching out to them, you know, talking to them, make, just like you would make any other kind of friend. Um, there are friends that I made because I thought they were cool and I was like, you're gonna be my friend, you know? And some of those people are still my friends today, you know? And, um, and I think that reaching out and forming a friendship with the black students on campus, um, having these conversations with them, listening, but also sharing, um, you know, I think one of the most important things is relationships that, that you know, you know your history and that you can actually um, share these things and they can learn something from um, the, the Jewish friend. They may not, they, this may be their first Jewish friend or maybe the only Jewish friend they have that actually knows these things, you know, and would actually change some of their mindset or just inform them. You know, I think that if those relationships are built, those genuine friendships, then when Jewish students are attacked on campus, it's a much more genuine and natural response for, for the black students to be like, hey, that's, that's wrong. Like, first of all, you know, I have Jewish friends and, you know, I talk to them all the time and, you know, they, this is like, these are lies or this is just completely, you can't just discriminate against them because, um, just because they're Jewish. And um, I think that that's, for me, you know, that's one of the, the ways you can even um, spark the beginnings of someone being an advocate for Israel, you know, is that um, they, they know people, they're close to people who actually have a connection to Israel. Um, and it's not as easy for them just to stand up and spout lies and hatred because, well, you know, my friend Sarah wouldn't like, wouldn't like if I just were to do that. Maybe I'll ask Sarah about this instead of posting on Facebook you know, about this issue. And, and I, in that way you are like an ambassador because you can actually go, okay, well, yes, the headlines say X, Y, Z, but that's not true. This is actually what's going on. This is not, this is an accurate or what they're saying is actually, this is why this is anti-Semitic, you know, and, and those things. I think that, yeah, genuine relationships is really how it starts. Um, and then those allyships are just, those are naturally gonna be there now because, you know, I know you, I like you, we're friends, you know, and, and we can go from there. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. All right. We have uh, one more question. Serena, if you can introduce yourself first, uh, that would be awesome. Serena. So it looks like we're having some audio difficulties. So I will read your question. Um, that you sent. My question is, there are many out there who, were, try who are, were trying to hijack Black Lives Matter movement and other social justice movements to promote an anti-Israel agenda. How do we counter this misinformation? That's a great question, Serena. Um, and it's a very, very good question. So for me, there, there are two main ways. One is, is the reason why Ipsy exists, which is education. Um, you know, is, is actually, you know, taking the time and, and showing whether it's your peers, whether, whatever, whatever your audience is, you're, you're on your platform, why the claims that are making are wrong. But the other thing is, and this is a petition that, this is a position that we've taken pretty strongly at Ipsy, <clears throat> is that a lot of, a lot of the social justice, but especially Black Lives Matter, which is a big, which has gotten um, a lot more traction this year again, 
is, you know, their structure is such that um, they, they lean anti-Israel, meaning, you know, at the, 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 the person who, found, who coined the term Black Lives Matter, who founded, you know, the, the, the organization who leads the movement in, in um, California and LA, along with another African-American studies professor, they are, um, they are anti-Israel. Her colleague is a, is a Farrakhan follower and supporter. And so even if <clears throat> there are people on the ground who may not be aware of these things, the problem is that in the leadership, that is, that is their bias. And so they are, they are leading their, their followers in the movement with uh, that biased agenda. Um, and so for me, my response to that has been to kind of change the framework. And so some of what the debate has been with Black Lives Matter has been, um, you know, okay, well, how do we support the black community if we can't support Black Lives Matter? And for me, that's, that's not really the right way to frame it. The right way to frame it is how can we support the black community? Because there are lots of ways to support black community, you know, without Black Lives Matter. We've existed before BLM and will exist after BLM. Um, and uh, it's just that BLM has taken such a center stage in everything right now. Um, so for me, I would say, again, relation, relationships, like I was answering the other question, relationships are important because you can actually convey these things um, to your friends, to your friends who are in Black Lives Matter, to your friends who um, may not be aware of these things. Um, you know, <laughs> like, um, and since we're talking about BLM, yeah, I mean, they're just, they're, they're facing some other challenges right now as we speak, you know, with, with the, the, the actual, uh, the, the big organization Black Lives Matter um, is in trouble with a lot of the other movements for um, just kind of taking donation money and not actually giving any funds to some of the other chapters. And so there's, there is a lot of, there is that corruption that's starting to bubble up as well. And it's because, in, in my opinion, it's because of, you know, the nature of, of their platform, the nature of the founder's agenda has been very anti a lot of things, but yes, very anti-Israel. Um, and uh, like some, and a lot of the leaders have been uh, proponents of, you know, Nation of Islam, Black Hebrew Israelites, and these things have been kind of connected. And so, um, yeah, one of the ways you can respond to their misinformation is by telling the truth, um, but also knowing, I think, knowing when something is, knowing when to not get involved with something at all. Me, and what I mean by that is, okay, maybe, you know, maybe some things can be rehabilitated or maybe some things can be redeemed, but other times, like with BLM, it's in such, the, it's in such a foundational place with Black Lives Matter, like their founding members and the, the, um, the leaders um, have this specific agenda that um, the best that you can do is get people to come away from that, you know, um, and um, leave that alone. Because as long as they're at the helm, it's always going to uh, devolve into an anti-Semitic, anti-Israel um, type of thing with these different, you know, demonstrations that are against Jewish people and, and all those things. Um, until, until those leaders can step down, that's what it's, that's unfortunately what's gonna be at the root of it. Um, so my advice would be, to yeah to to keep telling the truth and and trying to get people you know like i said steer people away from following that organization amazing amazing um unfortunately we are out of time uh joshua thank you so much um for being here with us and, and sharing your wisdom and your perspective and having this really important conversation with us uh we're very appreciative I, thank you so much for having me, Max. I really appreciate it. And the questions were incredible to all the students. You guys are right. Thank you for, for participating. או שלא עוזב, הוא מתגלה בחושך, בכל קצוות תבל, מי שהוא מסתכל.
אומר תודה להם על אהבת אמת, איך שאת רוקדת, גם הלב שלי רוקד איתנו. מים רבים לא יכבו את האש שלנו. איך שאת רוקדת, גם הכוכבים רוקדים איתנו. מים רבים לא יכבו את האש שלנו. אל תפחד, תשאף לדעת, אל תדאג, עוד תקיים. מי שבידו לגעת, יש שבליבו עוד לנחם. אל תפחד, ימים יבואו ועונות, שנה תחלוף. אתה תראה שעוד נגיע אל הכתוב. אל תפחד ממציאות נושכת ואנשים קרים. כל אחד סוחב בבטן, ומעט שעליהם רואים. כמה כוח יש ברגע, והנצח אין לו סוף. וכל דמעה שעוד תרד יגיע הצחוק. וזה הרגע, הנה באה השעה. מה תביא את הרוח? מה ימיס את הדממה? ויש סיבות לכל דבר. יש חלום שלא נגמר, בסוף הדרך עוד תהיה מאושר. וקדימה אל האופק, אל השמש הטובה. זה רחוק, אבל תגיע, קצת עייף וקצת צמא לאהבה שמחכה לך, תקטוף אותה כפרי בשל ואז תנוח, תרדם בעצם. וזה הרגע, הנה באה השעה, מה תביא את הרוח, מה ימיס את הדממה, ויש סיבות לכל דבר, יש חלום שלא נגמר בסוף הדרך. שלא נגמר, בסוף הדרך עוד תהיה מאושר 
Thank <laughs> you. מטען כבד, דחוס הדק, במגרות הלב, חוזר עובד רעב, אל אותו מקור, דופק על דל תחש, משקל היום. Hi everyone, my name is Eli Kudron. I am a third year student at Northeastern University studying international affairs and I'm joining you live today from Hollywood, Florida. So exactly a year ago, I got to go to Israel with the Hasbara Fellowship and that trip was a life-changing experience for me. I had been to Israel so many times, I had even spent a gap year in Israel, but going to Israel with Hasbara was a completely different experience. You don't go to Israel with Asbara just to learn the facts, which is definitely very important. But you go to Israel with Asbara to experience Israel, to meet Israelis that, lives in Zder- that live in Zderot under the threat of rockets, to meet former member of Knesset, Israeli journalists, Palestinians. Um, you go to visit Palestinian cities. You go to the north 
and spend a full day with a former captain of the army that will tell you everything about what's happening in Syria, in Lebanon, and all around the Middle East. And you get to meet so many other experts. But additionally to that, you get to spend two weeks with fellow students that are so passionate about this and that are ready to learn as much as possible to be the most effective on campus. And that's one of the biggest strengths of Asbara is that additionally to all of this, they also teach you how to be the most effective on campus. You're gonna learn how to create coalition, how to have conversation on campus while staying calm, which can be very challenging at times. But on top of that, you're also gonna learn how to be effective on social media, which is something I deeply care about as someone that is very active on social media. I got to learn so much from my trip uh, in Israel, but one of the main things that we'll always remember from that trip is that Eitan would always put an emphasis on why. Why do you care so much? Why do you put yourself in those uncomfortable situations? And now, whenever I'm on campus, as the former president now of the Israel Club, every time we had a challenge, I would remember that trip and I would remember, you know what, I'm doing it for a good reason. Hasbara really has a way to teach you about Israel, to make you experience Israel and to make you effective on campus like no other organization does. And I think this Israel Engage right now is the best proof for it. While most organizations have kind of taken a step back during this challenge, no, Hasbara is at the forefront. Hasbara is organizing this incredible seminar live that you can watch from anywhere. And I, I have just one thing that I want to tell all of you if you're watching today, go on HasbaraFellowship.com and apply to become a Hasbara Fellow. Because not only it is an experience that will change your life, but you'll be able to have an impact on campus like no one else does. No one else does. Welcome to Israel Engage Winter 2021. Students, lay leaders, speakers and educators, thank you all for being here. My name is Alan Levine, Executive Director of Hasbara Fellowships. I've been involved in pro-Israel campus activism for the better part of 15 years now. And when I was graduating college just over 11 years ago, we had anti-Israel propaganda, to be sure, but it wasn't quite what we see today. What we see today has crossed the line into blatant anti-Semitism and intimidation of Jewish students. Now, there's been a lot of progress. Students like yourselves have defeated anti-Israel boycott resolutions and held professors accountable when they've said things that crossed the line. But there's a lot of work to be done. Just this month, at Johns Hopkins University, a teaching assistant tweeted that he would fail all the Zionist students in his class. Well, think about that for a moment. A teaching assistant at Johns Hopkins University thought it was okay to post on social media that he would fail all the Zionist students in his class. Now, I bring that one up as opposed to bringing up more bombastic headlines swastikas on campus and so forth, which we've seen. I bring that one up because it was just so casual. There's a casualness today to intimidating Jewish students based on their beliefs. We're here together today to say that's not acceptable. We're here together today to say there needs to be a change and to begin to work on becoming and on bringing about that change. Now students, it's not lost on anybody that students today, you have a lot on your plates. From coursework to extracurriculars, and if you're like me, your life this year probably feels like one long Zoom meeting. But you're giving up your Sunday, and many of you gave up an entire week during winter break, to become Hasbara Fellows, to learn, to be educated, and to network with each other so that you can go back to campus and be the best pro-Israel campus leaders that you can be. So thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the Paul Bronfman Foundation for making today possible. I'd like to thank our Hasbara Fellowships Board of Directors and our network of lay leaders and donors for making our mission possible. Thank you all. Thank you all for doing what you do and for dedicating so much to the mission of Hasbara and to helping 
Jewish college students fight anti-Semitism and stand up for Israel on their campuses. Thank you. To close, I just want to share my dream. I now have a daughter who, God willing, will be on a college campus in about 17 years. And my dream is that she gets to go anywhere she wants in North America without fear of sharing her true beliefs and sharing all of her identity. That she gets to speak up in a discussion about the Middle East and talk about how she truly feels, and what she truly believes. That she could study abroad in Israel without fear of intimidation from peers or professors when she comes back. That's the dream. That's what we're here to work on together. So let's make the most of our day. Let's engage with our speakers and our educators. Let's engage with each other. I look forward to seeing what all of you can achieve back on your campuses. There's a tremendous power to have us all here together from so many campuses. So let's make the most of our day. I look forward to seeing the tremendous progress that I know all of you will make. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person later this year on a Hasbara mission to Israel. But in the meantime, let's have a great summit. Hi, this is Rabbi Elliot Mathias. I'm the founder of Hasbara Fellowships. We're so excited for all of you to be joining us in this in Israel Engage. For the last 19 years, we've been bringing students to Israel every summer and winter vacation. Over 3,000 students we brought to Israel to educate and train to go back to their campuses to be pro-Israel advocates. And this year we couldn't do it, a different world, but we pivoted and Israel Engage is really an innovative way to train students, support students, educate students, because the mission has to go on. You know, from the beginning, Hasbro Fellowships are uh, identity, really our goal has always been to empower students. We can give them uh, materials, we can give them funding, we can give them all kinds of resources, but at the end of the day, they're the ones on campus that has to know that have to know how to use those resources. And we can give them a speaker, but what happens the next day when the speaker's gone? We really have to empower them with the ability to stand up and be leaders on their campus. And really in Judaism, I believe as a rabbi, what ultimately makes us great is the ability of responsibility that we're able to take, the level of responsibility. When we look around and we realize maybe there really isn't anyone else to do the job, it has to be us, and we take that responsibility, that's really what brings us greatness. And today, students on college campuses, there's nobody else besides themselves. There's no ambassador, there's no uh, you know diplomat, it's them. They're the representatives of Israel and they have to take responsibility. One of my favorite stories that I always bring up on this, this topic is that we're coming up to Purim in, in just a few weeks. And in Purim, the, the core character is Esther. Esther was just a, a regular peasant girl, and she went all the way up to become one of the most powerful people in the land. Why? Because she took responsibility. When she was ready to take responsibility for the Jewish people to walk into the king's palace and say, take please, help my people, even though that was a life-threatening decision on her part, when she was willing to do that, to take responsibility for something so greater than herself, she became great. She became a leader, right? And today, right, we can all be leaders. We can all be leaders for our family, for our communities, online, whatever it might be, taking responsibility for the Jewish people, that really is the secret to our greatness. That's what Hasbro Fellowship is about, empowering every student on every campus that wants to stand up for Israel, that they can do it and they can make a difference. So thank you so much for joining us at Israel Engage. Enjoy the program, and we hope we can continue partnering with you into the future. Dear friends, students, participants, and speakers, I'm Dr. Jack Muscat, Chair of Hasbro Fellowships Canada. Over the past five years, we have seen Hasbara grow into a national organization, now including high school students. Our fellows have been busy coordinating Israel advocacy events and building relationships on campuses across North America with increasing success. In the wake of COVID-19, we have swiftly pivoted to offer more virtual content that features discussions, live workshops, cultural and musical offerings, that showcase the many faces of Israel. Israel Engage Winter Session is just such an event. With the generous support of the Paul Bronfman Foundation and the extraordinary work 
by our executive director, Daniel Corin and his wonderful team, both in Canada and in the U.S., my wife and fellow board member, Ruth Muscat, extend our heartfelt greetings to everyone here today. Ruthie has a few words. If you attend a Hasbro event, and it doesn't matter what stage of life you're at, you will find fun, friendship, and true learning, all very important things in our world today. All health and happiness to every one of you. I'm Yisrael Chai. I will now introduce to you the Instagram celebrity known as Glat Kosher, a.k.a. Dayoram. Yala Habibi. After Dayoram, we will go to our next session, Being Jewish on Campus with Isaac DeCastro, moderated by our Hasbara campus advisor, Gabrielle Weiss. Ken, hello, Yossi, where is my money, ya bin sona? I'm giving you all the Dead Sea products to sell. You don't give me any of the money. No, efo ata, ya maniak. Listen, achi, enough with the shtuyot. I'm trying to make a video for Haspara, Canada. I'll talk to you later. Maniak. Listen, chevre, Hasbara, Canada. You know what it means, Hasbara? The word Hasbara, it's meaning lehasbir, meaning to explain. So let the number one promoter, all of Israel, Yoram Glad Kosher, to explain something lehasbir, mashu lachem. Guys, I know that you're doing so much training how to do the combat of the anti shemut how to stop the anti-Zionists on the college campus. You're thinking, uh, ah, you need to learn how uh, the politics for the Milchemet Sheshet Yamim, you know, we came, we took, we, 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 we own the land, they coming, we there, we here, we there, Po Vesham, 242, 2 Bishishim. You don't need any of that, Hevre. I know they want to train you, you need to be politically correct. I to tell you, listen, my friend, it's okay. I'm eating hummus, you eating hummus, we eating hummus together. But I'll tell you like this. I'll explain uh, lachem like this, okay? There is one thing and one thing only that you need to tell in the anti shemut the, uh, the 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 anti zionist like this. You go to the college campus, you seeing uh, how you call them, the guys that's doing the BDS. The guys that's doing uh, the SJP, you know, Students' Justice in the Palestine. SJP, PB&J, Peanut Butter Jelly. You tell them like this, Hevre. They say, look, uh, I have a problem with Israel. Yes, this, that. Israel's this. Israel's that. You tell them one thing and one thing only. Startup nation, Benzona. Like that. You tell them startup nation. They say, look, you're... Um, uh, we have a problem with Israel because you're eating the hummus and the hummus is my hummus. You tell them like this. Shamatem al mashu called the iPhone. You know, the Bluetooth technology for the touch screen, for the face ID like this. I go open the iPhone. Shamatem al ze. Startup nation, Benzona. This is Israeli technology. Come on. Boycott that, my friend. And then you can ask all the vegans, you know, that's eating the salad. I need to eat my vegan salad. You say, uh, my friend, Shamatem Pam al something called the cherry tomato. You know, the genetic modification for the startup nation in the cherry tomato, kaha? Yes, my friends. This is startup nation, Benzona. They doing the Israeli technology to making the tomato like this, like the size of my eyeball. You want to eat a cherry tomato? Try to boycott that, my friend. It's simple, pashut, startup nation. That's it. And Hevre, I'll tell you something else, my friends. I'll tell you a little story while I have you here. You know, because I'm trying to teach you some, uh, you know, Israel advocacy, they call it. To advocate. So, advocate kacha, Hevre. I was one time doing the business for the property in a real estate in California. I was over at uh, the Universitat uh, USC, you know, the University of the Southern California, but I think it stands for uh, Universitat of the Southern Kusyot. Malay Kusyot. Anyway, so somebody coming up to me and they saying, Hello, Yoram, you Jewish? I'm like, Ma? They say, If you Jewish, where are your homes? Artima? What the fuck? That's how you're speaking to the Yoram, the number one in the intelligence unit for all the IDF? You're asking where is the homes? Tameshuga? Anyway, 
So I responding like this, and this is lesson uh, as para for you guys. I say, look, you know the technology for the innovation of the Iron Dome, the Kipat Parzel. Yes, my friends. When I was born, when the Yoram was born, you know, uh, they taking the horns and they going snip snip, and they taking, you know, I was Brit Milan also the snip snip and the snip snip of the horns. Tachles, they taking the technology and innovation that's coming from the horns of the Yoram and they using it to fuel the Kipat Parzel, the Iron Dome. So I said, I'm deflecting the rockets, I'm deflecting the anti shemut like the Iron Dome is deflecting the rockets, Kipat Parzel, Startup Nation. So yeah, my friends, I hope you're learning a thing or two from the Yoram on Hasbara, on the Israel Advocate. And uh, yeah, Tachles, thank you for the work you're doing for Am Israel. We are one nation, the startup nation, and uh, there's only one one promoter from Israel. It's the Yoram. So give me a follow on uh, TikTok, TikTok. Give me a follow on Insta uh, at Glad Kosher. And yalla, chevre, enjoy the conference. Yalla, balagan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Being Jewish on Campus with Isaac DeCastro. I'm your moderator, Gabrielle Weiss, and I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Advisor at Hasbro Fellowships. Isaac DeCastro is the CEO of Jewish on Campus, an online brand striving to amplify Jewish voices against anti-Semitism on college and university campuses. Isaac is a current senior at Cornell University, majoring architecture, art planning. And thank you so much for joining us, Isaac. And how about you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your Jewish identity? Sure, thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here today. So um, a little bit about myself. I am from Panama City, Panama, which is where I'm stationed right now. Um, I grew up in a predominantly Syrian community, which is like what the community is here. I am not Syrian. I come from a mixed background. My dad is pretty mixed Sephardi, mostly Hispano, Portuguese, Ottoman, and Syrian, and my mom is Ashkenazi, um, which is very interesting growing up in in this community. Um, I went to, you know, Jewish day school for most of my life um, within the, here, which is like mostly Orthodox. Um, and I mean, that was pretty much it. I, I was never very much into like anything Judaism. Um, I, I never really got into that. I was a straight A student. For most of my life except in everything that was like the Jewish subjects I pretty much got straight B's wouldn't put in any effort and that was my connection my connection was being inside this little bubble and that being just like a very mundane part of my life um it wasn't anything special everyone around me was Jewish growing up um that was the norm and then I went to college and I went to this very um, specific architecture program at Cornell University. Uh, and in this professional degree program where I was in a very small class, um, a very intense environment, there weren't many other Jewish people. I think there were two other Jewish people in my year, uh, which is like 60 people, very few other Jewish people that I knew of like in the years above. Um, and it was like a very interesting environment. I came from a very tight knit community and I went into this very tight knit also community, but that was completely like removed from the Jewish world. It was like a small like architecture world where that's what I was immersed in. And, you know, for like the first few years, I loved it and I loved um, being a part of this community, but I felt very distanced. I did not have time to go to Hillel or Chabad. Um, I spent my Friday nights working, um, you know, would only take off on like maybe Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur and that was it. Um, and even then it was like very weird for me to go into the Jewish spaces because I had not been there for most of the time. Um, so I felt this distance and then I started connecting. I took a few Jewish studies classes, which really kind of brought me back. And I was really interested in the cultural aspect of Judaism, um, 
the historical part, which I still am very much so interested in. And I started feeling anti-Semitism. Um, I think even from the time that I did summer college at Cornell before I got in, before I went, like I, I felt little pieces of anti-Semitism, whether it was within the classroom, whether it was like the type of lecture series that they would bring in um, or small comments from my friends or, or peers, which were ignorant um, or coming into this very, very like progressive environment and feeling the environment um, of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism and microaggressions or just like around me. So, having all of that happen, like I think brought me very much closer to Judaism and to my Jewishness. And I think I was pulled into it. When Corona happened, I got like a bit more involved within like the Jewish space on social media, which is a very interesting space full of very interesting people that come in for different reasons. I think for me, it was um, kind of trying to show like, and talk about Sephardi history as well as, you know, connect in a different way that wasn't necessarily religious um, as I wasn't connected to religious life on campus, et cetera. And I started seeing people here and there post stories about anti-Semitism on their campus. And I was realizing how I had seen so much and like no one was talking about these things. It wasn't being picked up by the media um, no one really was talking about it on social media either um, because I think many Jewish students are scared of the repercussions that has socially, career-wise, et cetera. And I was like, what if there is a space where you can post these things anonymously and there are no repercussions? You're not putting your name. You're not even giving me any information if you don't want to. Would that change things? And... After that, things exploded. And now I'm very much like um, deep into this world. I put out a tweet, some people responded and we made this page together and it became what it is now. Um, so essentially that's a bit of like my, my, my Jewish background kind of coming into um, where I am now, but very much open to any questions on either or. Thank you. I think it's definitely really important to share a lot of those stories, especially, you know, coming from a non-religious background, um, dealing with so many problems on such a very well-known campus, I would say, especially in America. Um, so thank you. And I really do commend you for dealing with all of that and wishing you luck in the program at school. Um, and I'm sure that many of our audience members have seen Jewish on Campus rise to center stage since its first post back in July. Can you talk a little bit more about the process of starting the page, building up the brand? I know that you've expanded from Instagram to Twitter and TikTok um, and talk a bit about, you know, what compelled you to start it with your other founder. For sure. So we started it as a group of six people that we kind of met online um, in July. And it started off as what it like, what it is like at first glance you see it's a page to post anonymous stories and you submit the stories we put them there um and that's what it was at first we kind of had this inkling that it could be a little bit more so early on we kind of knew we were onto something we were using social media in a savvy way we were making these like pretty little squares to put on your story and people were taking attention to it we were not only building on this like structure that had been built during, you know, like the age of the infographic or whatever it had been um, building of activism on social media, but we were kind of combining elements of all these different pages, like the um, anonymous story structure, which is one that's common for other minorities. But we added like the infographic, like the educational we added like a news aspect and we kind of centered it all in a place where Jewish and young Jewish people had not had within the social media sphere um and definitely not in such an undiplomatic and kind of grassroots way which is what we were doing and 
the first week we were just growing in like thousands and th thousands of followers per day, like a thousand to 2000 followers, um, which was overwhelming. Um, and when we started like putting out the infographics, apart from growing organically from the stories we were growing from that too. Um, so I think as we grew, we knew that we wanted to be more than that. Um, and we now know that we want to really go into the space of like doing campaigns on campus and working with administrations and keep posting the stories and keep working with students in order to create a better space for Jewish students on campus, as well as maintaining this space on social media, which can be a center for Jewish students. Um, so kind of that's where we're going and we're looking into what that's going to look like post COVID world. Um, but we're filing for nonprofit status. Hopefully that'll come in soon, um, which is really exciting. We are building a high profile advisory board and we're kind of changing up what the organization is gonna look like and all of that and kind of really becoming an entity within this world, which we're super excited to like show the world within the next few months. That's incredible. Masato Von applying for that. And I really do wish you guys most success. Um, I know you just briefly touched on this, that the submissions when students write in are anonymous. How did you decide that that was the path you were going to take? Um, and was this like a discussion between the group? Have you had people wanting to share their names? anything of that sort when they're submitting their incidences? Yeah, that was a huge conversation at first. And I think it's still something that people are very curious about, like why anonymously, why don't you put the name, like why don't you put the name of professors, um, et cetera. And it was very important for us to have the school there. It was very important to show exactly where it was happening, that it was happening everywhere and could have some sort of like ground um, in which people could see how tangible it is as well as kind of pointing to the universities that need some reform um, or changes on their campus um, and so people know what's going on where. Um, so the anonymity is interesting if you see our form it's like you can put your name you can put your email it's just not required um, so if you do, we can like contact you, put you in touch with lawyers, put you in touch with different organizations that can help um, or the university if they reach out. But the importance of the anonymity, as I said before, is that it reaches more people than it would if it weren't. Um, and we never put the name on the page just because we want to protect the identity of the students and just like have it be uniformly anonymous um so no one gets you know any unwanted attention or anything it's easier to just have it uniformly like that um jewish students have been put in a weird spot on campuses like you can't outwardly speak out against anti-semitism without without fearing social repercussions or even academic repercussions. So the fact that it's difficult to, you know, fact check some of these stories or um, track down some students or work with universities when we don't have necessarily the student like came as a second fiddle to being able to put the stories out there, which I think wouldn't have been possible without the anonymity. I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it does. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and besides keeping people anonymous, you did just mention you include the university's name in the post, as well as a good amount of the comments I would say under most posts are people tagging the universities themselves. Have any universities or administrations responded wanting to reprimand the professors or any alleged students who took part in the anti-Semitism that's being written about? So many universities do respond. I think 
I mean, I don't know who's behind like these accounts. I'm assuming like student interns or just like someone at the university that's not necessarily higher up. They essentially respond and usually give us bias reports um, and ask us to like put them in contact, sorry, with the student um, to fill out this bias report um, for them. I think the problem is these bias reports don't work, which is why um, like our page exists in a way. Um, I've, we've had, like, I think for Ithaca College, like very early on, the president actually commented, which was nice. Um, I think some like reaffirmed the fact that this is not welcome up there on their campus. I think the issue is like bringing awareness only does so much. So there's only so much that we can do on social media. The thing that we're doing, I think is like a larger push to get more Jewish students to speak out, get more parents to speak out, get more donors to speak out, get just like Jewish alumni to speak out in general and show the universities that they will pressure them to change. They will pressure them to adopt IRA. They will pressure them to reprimand like the anti-Semitic um, resolutions they're adopting on their student assemblies and stuff like that. So I think it's part of a larger change more so than just universities responding here. Um, it happens, they do, and uh, like, I'm thankful that they're, they're noticing, but I think it has to come from more action than just um, like filling out a bias report. And that's gonna take longer than what we're seeing right now. Thank you. You just mentioned the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. For all of our students listening, um, if people are not familiar with it, it's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which has been adopted um, by countless countries, different organizations, nonprofits, which is really great. And we're big fans of it as well here at Hasbro Fellowships. And I think it's a really good first step in the goal of speaking out against anti-Semitism, bringing up into student governments, assemblies, bringing it directly to the president or the dean of a university. Um, there's definitely, I think, more that needs to come with IRA, steps that you can implement along with it. Do you have any in mind or things that you would like to accomplish along with IRA, you know, training for professors or administration on campus, mandatory Holocaust education, education on, you know, different minority groups, anything like that? Is this something that you guys have discussed at Jewish on Campus? Yeah, I think there there's a lot of things. I think um, diversity training, like that we do for like faculty and stuff like that, I think needs to be inclusive of Jewish students or faculty, et cetera. So getting diversity trainings out there eventually for Jews, I think, Obviously adopting IRA is great, but there's more so to that. There has been universities that have adopted IRA and it hasn't necessarily changed much. I mean, it gives ground to Jewish students and I think universities definitely should be doing it. It's a huge step, but it has more to do with campus culture and the culture that's growing in the United States and in Europe, perhaps more so that it has to do with a university's policy. Like we're not seeing a growth of anti-Semitism with because universities don't have the correct definition of of anti-Semitism of Jew hatred. We're seeing a rise because there is a change in the culture, a drastic change in society that we're seeing where a type of anti-Semitism, which is anti-Zionism. And this is like, in my observation, my opinion from what I've seen so far has become very much not only acceptable, but almost required um, to be part of progressive society. And within universities, that's like a breeding ground, especially like a lot of uh, progressive professors and, um, you know, students, especially like, you know, Northeastern universities and um, these prestigious places. 
So IRA is just one thing, but another thing we have to do is very much fight campus culture. And I think, I don't know how universities necessarily have to take steps. I think they have to hire Zionist professors, not only anti-Zionist professors, especially within Jewish studies departments. I think Jewish students need sp spaces where they feel safe. And I think Jewish studies needs to be one of them. Um, like there's like, there's no reason why professors within Jewish studies departments should not should, like, should have like these radical opinions on like, and, and support BDS. Not to say that I, I, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in academic freedom. So like that can, can be a thing and I will not never like object to people having different opinions, but I feel personally like there is a complete lack of diversity on that end and representation for Jewish students. Um, so there's no other option. That's what I'm saying. So I think universities have to work hard for that um, to have that. So it's not, um, so there, there's diversity there because I think at this point, whether it's Jewish students who are feeling uncomfortable, it's also the general student populations with ha which have no connection to Israel or Palestine or Judaism who are being only given one perspective. Um, you're talking about Holocaust education. I mean, I think that goes back to not colleges. I think that within you know high schools and middle schools, um, Jewish or non-Jewish, I think there needs to be a better effort to educate on the Holocaust. Um, so students are prepared to come to college with that. I think there's definitely um, things to be open there and things to be explored there. Like maybe within universities, they should have like delegations to go to um, March of the Living and stuff like that. I don't know, but I think there is so much change to be done um, for sure. Thank you. And your experience is the anti-Israel movement and the boycott divestment sanctions movement responsible in part for the harassment and targeting of Jewish students on college campuses today. Yeah, for sure. I think whenever, whenever that gets brought up, it's just uh, a green light for other students to harass Jewish students on campus for their opinions or just a red light for students to Jewish students to feel comfortable saying their opinions on campus and whenever these resolutions come up it's just the worst and just such an unsafe environment on campus thank you for sharing that my last question for you today is what do you think it means to be Jewish on campus today without like with with I don't want to seem pessimistic, but I think being Jewish on campus today means having three options, either letting go of part of your Jewish identity, letting go of your Zionism and letting yourself be indoctrinated by what is being given to you at universities nowadays to fit into the social scene, to fit into the academic scene. It means either staying quiet and having no opinions on that end and trying to be completely diplomatic and suppressing your opinions um, and identity in a way, or maybe constraining it to like Hillel or Habad, or it means being outspoken and being in a precarious position where you're going to have people not like you, whether it is professors or students, um, and risking that and risking the consequences which, with co which come with that, which aren't pretty. Like you are seen as a controversial person on your campus. So, None of these options are good. I think being Jewish on campus has become like taboo in a way. And it be 
has become complicated and a very specific experience for many Jewish people, which I think they feel like they have to face and they have to go through. Um, and that just shouldn't be the case, which is what, what we're working on at Jewish on campus. Um, like, I feel like, I feel like Jewish students should, you know, be able to feel comfortable wherever, wherever they are and, and progressive, conservative, whatever space there are and, and wherever on campus they fit um, in whatever campus they are on. Um, so I don't know if, if that answers your question of what being Jewish on campus means. I think, um, it, I think it means having a specific experience on campus nowadays, um, which has become a struggle. And I think to not like be completely pessimistic, um, it, it means also finding community and finding community within Jewish spaces and Jewish students. And um, even if you wouldn't find it before because of the situation and because of facing anti-Semitism, um, sometimes people who wouldn't necessarily buy, be finding, would be finding community are coming in and joining together in purpose um, and fighting for the truth and for, for our identities, which I think in a way is beautiful. Thank you for that answer. And thank you so much for joining us today and to all those watching for joining us in Being Jewish on Campus with Isaac DeCastro. And I'd like to invite in a few of our Hasbro interns for a Q&A session. I'm going to pass it over to Ellie Sheva Eisenberg, who has a question for Isaac now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellie Sheva, and I'm a Hasbara Fellow at McGill University in Montreal. And Isaac, I was wondering how your experiences um, as a Jew from Panama, who then moved to the States for school, how that influenced you as a person and you as an Israel advocate? For sure. I think it's interesting coming from Panama to the United States for a college experience um, and going into a very different Jewish community, um, especially when I was coming into no Jewish community within like my architecture program, et cetera, where I was very much isolated and coming in from a, a bubble, a very tight knit um, community here in Panama. And I think the way it inspired me was kind of that separation of that like very big change and coming from like a place where that was like completely the norm and my everyday life and going to classes about Judaism every day, like half the day. Um, in my day school to having to choose to, to, to do that and going into an environment that was very much, I think in general, uh, anti-Israel um, and being maybe the, the first Jewish person someone has met or um, like the only pro-Israel person in the room. Um, and I think that put a huge responsibility on me which I think is a very normal thing for for Jewish people to feel not necessarily that it's fair but like I, I took it with pride and wanted very much to to take that role and to educate people and to um educate people on on Israel on my connection with Israel on the diversity of Jewish people being a, a Sephardi Jew from Panama City um, and to educate like even within the Jewish community and like like all, all these different things um, like even within the the Jewish activist community I think that there is like a need to learn about this diversity and to, like to include like orthodox people which is like the community I come from so the differences that 
what were the norm for me growing up really inspired me to showcase them and to celebrate them once I was taken out of the environment. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. All right, our next question is from Carol, one of our high school interns. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Um, my question is Jewish on campus has unfortunately shared over 300 examples of anti-Semitism on campus on your Instagram. Do you feel this desensitized that like this is happening on campuses and university administrations are doing nothing about it or does it strengthen your resolve? I, I think I need like a, a constant, constant like revitalization when, when I'm like reading these stories, I don't think I'm desensitized. I think that whenever I read one of these stories, um, there'll be like one or two that are like, wow, like I, I really need to do something and being constantly like within this space and within social media. And like, even though I don't do this often because of like how much of a toll it takes like looking at the comment section and, and seeing how much people ne need like an education on on these topics i think it inspires me to keep going with the work um especially like when universities are not necessarily taking charge or even like in the negative aspect like becoming worse and like passing referendums on, on student assemblies and stuff like that um and it goes farther than university action. So even if all the universities were to today take like the IRA definition and adopt it, every single one of the universities in the United States, I would still think there is a need for Jewish on campus because it goes farther than university action and university administrations. It's very much a problem of campus culture and something that has been perpetuated by faculty and students as much as like the lack of university action. And it wouldn't necessarily end today if every university were to take action. So I think like my inspiration comes from all of these different, different aspects um, to keep going forward because it's so necessary. Thank you. Thank you for your question. All right, our next question is from Sira, another high school intern. Hi, I'm Kira Orvit, a Hasbro high school intern from Tannenbaum Chat here in Toronto. My question is, what has the response been like by people who follow your page but aren't Jewish? Were most of the people aware that anti-Semitism even is a problem on campus? Thank you so much for your question. I think, no, I, I don't think necessarily they they are aware. I think we've had quite a few responses from people who want to be allies and want to um, help out and speak out for their Jewish friends and take action. I, like many of my non-Jewish friends follow my page, which I think is wonderful. Um, I think many people aren't aware. And I think that that is because of the nature of what anti-Semitism is. Um, and right now, I think the main type of anti-Semitism we see is anti-Zionism and like the singling out of Israel and demonization of Israel or like in this case, students who support um, the, the existence of the only Jewish state. And for many people, they have been educated that that is legitimate criticism or that um, that isn't necessarily anti-Semitism. And that is kind of an education that is forming now. And I think that many people's response is like, at first, like, wait, this isn't anti-Semitism. So it is our job to educate them on how it is, on how it is a form of the world's oldest hatred and have them understand how this actually makes Jewish students feel very unsafe on their campuses. Um, so 
it's a process. Um, and even though I think many people are seeing our page and are like, wow, yeah, there's, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. I think for many, it's like, wow, I didn't understand that this is something that made you feel this way on your campus or wow, I didn't understand that like, um, like the deadly exchange referendum, which um, blames police brutality in the United States to Israel. Like, wow, I didn't understand how that actually relates to like the centuries old blood libel. So I think part of it is yes, being surprised by how much anti-Semitism there is, but I think it's also seeing how anti-Semitism can go by unnoticed when you are um, someone who isn't necessarily like targeted by it and understanding it. So it takes many facets. And I think we've gotten, gotten the response of, of people being thankful for the education we're giving them as well as bringing awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. All right, and our last question today is from another Hasbro intern, Lear. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Isaac. It is a pleasure to hear you speak today. I'm Lear, a freshman attending Urpen Atawot and passionate Hasbro high school intern. I'm wondering, since there is a lot of misinformation about Jewish identity, especially as it relates to Israel, what can we do as students to help counter this misinformation and educate others, especially students who aren't Jewish? Thank you so much for your question, Lear. Um, so I think the best way to do it is to approach people as human beings. So like make, like hopefully show them that, you know, you're like a normal person, a good person who has a connection to the state when that you are not killing people in, in the Middle East, that um, your connection expands farther than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, that, you know, like you understand and you want to show them what Zionism is and what your connection to Israel is. Um, farther from like the political aspects of it, from like Jewish history, from religion, and just trying to educate them from a human point of view, I think like coming in from a place of, understand of understanding and listening back and forth. But I think there is another aspect of also like standing our ground of um, speaking up as any other minority would and showing them and showing people that we are willing to stand up for what we believe in and willing to, you know, take a stand and be as fierce and as vocal as any other minority would. And we will demand that they listen to us if they won't. So I think both of these approaches are really important um, in having people listen to us. I think both, like ultimately both approaching people as a human being and in dialogue and also standing up for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us today. And thank you to Isaac and back to you, Daniel. Thanks, Gabs and Isaac, for that truly informative session. I think especially for those of us who aren't students in the audience, we learned a lot from that. And now for her second set, Ta'ir. Hello again, everyone. I feel so grateful uh, for this opportunity to be here with all of you. And, um, you know, in the process of writing my, my new album, I go back to songs that I used to listen to as a kid and old Jewish songs, folk songs. It doesn't matter if it's um, an Ashkenazi 
a Sephardi, a Yemenite song. They all touch me so deeply in my heart and in my soul, just like this next song, Shehahoret, the dark one, which is originally sang in Ladino. this feeling of being um, a late bloomer, doing things at my own pace, simmer slowly, just like the Jewish stew, Hamin. Look at the 
I'm Taya Chaim. This is Michael Meital. Stay happy, stay healthy. It is my honor to now introduce the final session of our conference today, which is pertinent not only to the students in the audience, but to all of you aspiring online activists. In the age of Corona, especially, with many of us spending way more time online, I invite you to listen to two tremendous social media activists, Rudy Rockman and Leora Rez. Rudy is the voice of the next generation and, in my opinion, a stellar advocate for Israel and the Jewish people. Leora is known for her widely popular Instagram account, Jewish Chick. She is also the founder of StopAntiSemitism.org. This session will be moderated by the chair of our Hasbara Young Professional Committee, Tefera Zainer Cohen, who is also a proud Hasbara fellow and law student at the University of Windsor. Thanks so much, Daniel, for that fabulous intro, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm so excited to welcome you all to this discussion on social media activism with Rudy Rockman and Leora Rez. I'm your moderator. My name is Tifera Zainer Cohen. I'm a Hasbara alum and chair of Hasbara Canada's YP committee. So this past year has been like nothing we've seen before. With the COVID pandemic, I think it's safe to say that a lot of us have had a little more screen time this year than usual. We've pivoted our studies, our businesses, basically our whole lives to the virtual world in ways we've never had to before. And as we've moved online, we've experienced anti-Semitism and the demonization of Israel in new ways. Anti-Semitic memes, spread like wildfire, unverified conspiracy theories abound, and clickbait vitriol goes largely unchecked. In the time of corona, knowing how to effectively engage in activism via social media has taken on a whole new meaning. I have so many questions on how to be an effective advocate online, and I know a lot of you guys watching this do too. So we've called in the big guns, two powerful forces in the social media world to help us out. But before we jump into questions, I'm just going to briefly introduce our two experts. Leora Rez, otherwise known as Jewish Chick, is the founder and director of StopAntiSemitism.org, a grassroots organization that is at the forefront of exposing anti-Semites and holding them accountable. After starting Jewish Chick, which now spans more than 90,000 followers across Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, Leora decided to use her growing online presence to more actively fight anti-Semitism. In 2018, she founded StopAntiSemitism.org to call out those exhibiting hateful behavior towards Jews and Judaism with huge success online and off. Alongside the website, StopAntiSemitism.org is now active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, receiving over a million hits across their channels every month. 
Leora is one of the foremost social media advocates fighting for the Jewish people against anti-Semitism. And she notes that anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem, it's an all of us problem. Rudy Rockman is another one of our greatest Jewish and Israel rights activists on social media. With tens of thousands of followers across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, Rudy shares his boots on the ground perspective through Instagram and TikTok videos, while his long form interview debates have become a staple for those of us wanting to learn how to effectively advocate on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people on campus and off. Utilizing social media to reach across political and geogra geographical barriers, Rudy has also created a virtual space for meaningful dialogue between Jews, Muslims, Israelis, and Palestinians a space that now extends beyond the virtual world thanks to the new not-for-profit organization, The Home. Leora and Rudy are both incredible advocates for the Jewish people. Leora, Rudy, we're so lucky to have the opportunity to speak to both of you. And so I just wanna thank you both for taking the time to have this discussion with us. And with that, which was a mouthful, let's jump into the good stuff. So to start us off, I just want to talk a little bit about how you both became such influential advocates. Rudy, you have tens of thousands of followers online. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Sure. So first of all, I actually identify myself as an ad activist and not an advocate. Um, in my view, an advocate is someone who supports a cause, whereas an activist is someone who realizes the problems that exist and make efforts to push their people forward or their cause forward. So I identify as an activist. Different people have different definitions. Uh, for me, the way I started in this space on social media was actually by coincidence. Because I've moved through so many different places, uh, different countries, different states, and grown up really meeting new people, I extended the amount of friends that I was allowed to have on Facebook. So I passed the 5K and Facebook in 20 2015 suggested that I create a page so that I would do all of my activism and Israel related things on a page and keep my private life on my private Facebook. And from there, I just started posting my content and my expression and my work on this page. And slowly it grew as I went to Colombia. I started to make more videos over there and it started to become more, more mainstream. And Instagram became relevant when IGTV uh, came out because previously it was only post and you couldn't post any longer content than two minutes. And now with TikTok coming for, for Gen Z and for younger ages, it's just these are tools to be able to communicate to the generation that we have. And I think there's a lot of cons and also pros to social media. A lot of people talk about the cons of it being an echo chamber of it, you know, having confirmation bias or whatever you look into, you're going to find. But there's a lot of pros also to social media. Sure, you can spread false information, but you could also spread the truth. You could also interconnect and unite people. And something that I've actually realized with TikTok in specific is that it's based not only on the algorithms of what you like, but the geolocation that you have. So when you go to France, you'll see French TikToks. When you're in America, you'll see American TikToks. And in Israel, because Israelis and Palestinians are so close in proximity, mm -hmm. they're actually experiencing each other's TikToks. They're seeing their expression, their individuality, their pain, their suffering, their humor, and who they really are. So it's a lot harder to convince an entire generation that the other side is your enemy when they've experienced them firsthand and see their humanity. So I think, so just following up on that, so do you think... You know, I, I've heard a lot about the idea of the echo chamber, and it's definitely a big thing. But do you think that this idea of like geolocation and, and how, you know, social media platforms can kind of decide what to show you depending on where you are, do you think that'll have an impact? I mean, I can see that you, you believe that it, it's, it's meaningful, but do you think that'll have an impact as you move forward with your advocacy work as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the millennials, Gen Z and generations to come afterwards that either grew up with social media coming into their lives or social media already being in their lives have a different way of looking at the world. We're way more interconnected. We believe very quickly that you can reach someone, be able to communicate with someone. And I, I notice it with a lot of the older generations, whenever they're talking about Israelis and Palestinians, it's like, that'll never happen. That's impossible. And this idea of it's impossible doesn't really exist with younger generation. Of course, there are individuals that are older, individuals that are younger, that have the opposite views. But for the most part, there's a lot of optimism and the ability to think outside of the box and the ability to believe that you can very quickly connect with someone else uh, is really predominant within the younger generation. So I think that, plus the fact that 
specifically when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because we're in such close proximity on the land because it's such a small place that because of the geolocation on certain applications that allows people to see different content based on where they're located allows the younger generation to actually connect with others. And I think that's a beautiful way to, to look at social media. For sure. Absolutely. I think I'm going to be thinking about that for a while because that's a really interesting um, new thing that I hadn't really thought about before. Uh, Leora, I just want to turn to you for a second and get a little bit about your background and your history as well. So you first became an influencer as Jewish chick, um, but have become increasingly involved in the fight against anti-Semitism since then. So tell us your story. Why did you pivot towards combating anti-Semitism? Give us a little bit of insight. Sure. So in 2012, I had a baby. And prior to that, I had worked in structured finance. Um, And my husband and I decided uh, with the crash of the commercial real estate markets a few years before, you know, it was a good time. I would be a become a stay at home mommy. So with my personality that didn't exactly go too well. So I connected in, I, I want to say 2012, 2013, um, I started an Instagram page and connected literally to other stay-at-home moms who were previous professionals that were in their late 20s and early 30s um, that were looking for an out. And I would concentrate on, um, you know, fashion, lifestyle, parenting, but then sprinkle my love of Judaism and my Zionistic opinions, um, literally not in a purposeful way, but in my naive mind, I'm like, does isn't every Jew a proud Jew and isn't every Jew a Zionist? So I didn't know any different. Um, fast forward to today, it's kind of like, no, that's not how life is. But the, as the page exploded and as I... Um, you know, merged onto different platforms. I created a website, which I fully monetized, and then a Facebook page. I noticed that the amount of anti-Semitism that I was experiencing grew as my, uh, as the popularity of the brand grew. And I noticed that the anti-Semitism wasn't stemming from society's acceptable norm of the white supremacist neo-Nazi. I was receiving so much hate from, um, you know, the radical left, even um, from Jews, from Muslims. Um, and I was very frustrated as why those channels of anti-Semitism were never really spoken about, that mm-hmm. the existing organizations that were there to fight anti-Semitism barely spoke about it. And if they did, they were whispering about it. So in 2018, I sort of said to myself, I'm like, you know what, I amassed this great audience. And while I love what I'm doing, and I'm very fortunate, I want to take it to the next level. And, you know, really do something that affects me personally. I'm an immigrant from the Soviet Union, we came here to escape the horrors of socialism and anti semitism that frequently follows. Um, those economic policies and political beliefs of communism. And I said to myself, I'm like, I cannot believe just 30 years after I'm sitting here and as a mother to a small child myself, I'm literally dealing with something that my parents and grandparents and Mm -hmm. other family had to deal with, that this is in America, that literally fast forward to 2020, I'm thinking to myself, And I have friends that are saying, you know what, it's not good for our children to attend so-and-so college. It's very anti-Semitic. So I said to myself, I'm like, you know what, I've had enough. I've never been, you know, the quiet source, the quiet sort of person. I've never, you know, been afraid to ruffle any feathers. And in 2018, I started this um, grassroots organization. And in the two years that we've been doing this, I'm so proud of the explosive traction that we've managed to achieve again in such a short short time that with all the negatives of social media there are such amazing success stories that really allows us to reach um the jewish populations whether it's my parents generation or um you know my generation or young teenagers that are really Mm -hmm. like wow like i'm thank you for you know, showing what's out there. And I've been dealing with this since middle school, for instance. So there's, there's the negative dark side of social media. And then there's definitely the positive. 
I find it so interesting for that both of you, you know, uh, Rudy, I remember, you know, when I heard you speak recently, you, you talked a lot about how you'd made the decision to transfer from UCLA to Columbia because it was one of those more, uh, the, one of those schools that was known for being more anti-Semitic. And so Leora, I just find it so, you know, amazing to see where, where you were kind of, you know, called, called to action by hearing, you know, a little bit about your friend's concerns about exactly what it was that Rudy chose to take up on. You know, I, I feel like we tend to forget that we are really all in this fight together. And, and so, you know, knowing that both of you were kind of called to action in your own ways uh, by, by similar sort of manifestations of antisemitism and, and wanting to combat that, it's, it's really amazing to see. Um, so, you know, I, I think, wow, like, what, are, what amazing stories and, and seeing how you've both come into that and, and expanded on that. And so with that kind of context in mind, I kind of, I kind of want to move towards talking about your current influencer status. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that while you guys both came to this work, uh, you felt very called to it as a, as I think a lot of us do. And I wish more of us did. Um, you, it seems like you utilize very different approaches to advocacy, uh, online. And so I just kind of wanted to have a little bit of a discussion around your, your, your own approaches and why you've chosen this style. And so Leora, just to follow up with you, you know, I, 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 I know that stopantisemitism.org has taken what I would say is a much more proactive approach to calling out antisemitism as opposed to something happening and then, you know, reacting to it. You are really on the front lines of this is not good and we need to stop this before something else happens. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, why did you choose to take, you know, this much more proactive approach in your in your advocacy online? Um, so. I think it's safe to say that the avenues that were previously taken, which was a more reactive approach, were not working. And I think all of us can agree that, you know, young children are taught, if you do this, there will be this sort of punishment, right? Um, I think that with most races and ethnicities, if something is done against them, it's more, um, it's, it's common knowledge that there will be consequences to the people that perpetuate hate or actions against them. When it comes to the Jewish people, uh, we tend to kind of shy away from attention. We shy away from calling um, out the perpetrator, perpetrators. We, we don't want conflict, right? So that mentality of digging our heads in the sand for so long is not working. Mm -hmm. We believe, and I'm a firm believer, that if you don't want something to happen, you have to set a subsequent pathway that shows A, B, and C are going to happen if you do it, right? And it goes back to the psychological um, sort of child rearing that we were all brought up with that if you do this and it is wrong, you will be punished and you will, A, B, and C will happen. So I take this mentality, and even though it sounds so elementary and trivial, but it appears to be working. And when we do call out these anti-Semites, whether it be on social media, whether it be in person on college campuses, um, you know, th they're not, it's not expectant. Um, we've received, I can tell you, a lot of critique from even our own um, colleagues, which again, I respectfully disagree at times with. Um, but I feel that when we call out anti-Semites and we hold them responsible, we tend to see a much greater result in um, holding off other actions. I can tell you that on TikTok, for instance, we feature um, an anti-Semite every single day, and we've sort of developed this relationship where, um, you know, I, I think on weekends, we, we take turns manning the social media accounts, and sometimes we lag, and we get so many comments on the weekends when we don't feature somebody, like, hey, where's the TikTok guy of the day or girl of the day? So people are looking, people are looking um, to us to hold these anti-Semites accountable. And we've received um, and had a lot of success stories. Mm -hmm. um, we have spoken with a lot of these people. We have, um, you know, set them up with a lot of volunteering opportunities. 
Um, we have had expulsions from schools. We've had people lose their jobs. Um, we've had people apologize profusely, which again is wonderful. So as long as there's a set action, um, actionable something happening, we're, we're happy. Um, but again, going back to your point is that I personally was sick of us really digging our heads in the sand and saying, you know what, it's okay. We don't want to, you know, call attention to it and yada, yada. No, this is what, <laughs> this is what's gotten us into this mess part of it. Um, sure. So we personally think our motto is that we always, always want to be reactive and pro uh, or proactive, sorry, versus reactive. Right. And, and so I just want to absolutely. And, and Rudy, I'm, I'd love to hear, to hear your take on, on this as well. What advice would you have for, for those of us who are watching uh, in terms of how they can be more effective on social media as well? Yeah, I think overall, there are many tips that I can give. Definitely empower yourself, know how to debate, know how to create coalitions, know how to speak, um, you know, give yourself some sort of growth that you have courage and are able to deal with those situations, know the arguments of the other side so that when you're getting into a conversation, you know, you feel confident, but all of a sudden you're hearing arguments that you've never heard about. And now you don't know how to address them because you never actually took the time to hear the other side's narrative. And even while hearing the other side's narrative, there's a lot of truths there that you learn and your narrative itself grows and expands and evolves. Um, so definitely know the other side and know what skills you have. Some people are good with public speaking. Some people are good with graphic design. Some people are good or are passionate about medicine. I think every individual has the power to bring light and to make the world a better place. And we have to ask ourselves really this question every day. What are the skills that I have in terms of what I've developed or what I was born with? What are the skills that I could attain and want to have to, to give me additional things? And how do I make the world a better place for the problems that I see? And this is a question that we should really ask ourselves daily because our situation changes. You know, what I could do and what I was aware of and the skills that I had while I was Columbia is different post two, three years after graduation, will be different in 10 years, was different 10 years before Columbia. And so every individual is in a situation one day, you know, we'll have kids. And those kids also is our responsibility to help empower them and bring light. And that becomes an element of what we need to do. Um, you know, you may be in a, in a social circle that it's important to spread light there. You may be in a professional circle that it's important to do there. You can do it on a micro level. You can do it on a macro level. You can do them simultaneously. So I think each individual has to ask themselves questions daily of what am I good at? What can I develop in order to become better? What are the problems that I see around me and how do I make this world a better place? So there's no answer that I can give to people and this is what you need to do because everyone is different and everyone has their own path and it's up to them to find their path to, to make it better. However, we need to also realize that, you know, it, you're, no one is perfect. So a lot of people look at the content that I make and they're like, oh, well, we have Rudy or, you know, Rudy knows how to argue and he knows I don't know everything. And I wasn't born with, with knowledge. I was born like anybody else. So everything that I've picked up is from trial and error and experience and going out there and putting myself out there and learning and growing and making a mistake and fixing. So just because you don't feel as confident as, let's say, you would see a video of me and Leora uh, speaking about anti-Semitism or debating someone or dealing with anti-Semitism doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and start and engage and learn and grow and do stuff. Because no one has full confidence in the sense that they know everything because no one will ever know everything. So don't be afraid to, to step out there, to put yourself uh, out there, to engage, to learn, to grow, and to have the humility to know that we each have to work on ourselves to become better every day. Absolutely. And I think, I think that, that both of both, both, uh, both of you of our speakers, you know, these are, these are suggestions that, that go beyond social media and, and extend to, I mean, how we live our lives every day and, and really just being proud and, and empowered and, uh, in, in who we are and, you know, sharing that with the rest of the world, because I really do believe. And, and I think, you know, you've both touched on this so brilliantly as well, that at the end of the day, the real, the greatest, um, the greatest tool that we have in our arsenal, whether it be in fighting anti-Semitism or in, you know, fighting for Jewish justice or in promoting our, our, or in our, our love of Israel, whatever it is, you know, it's really this idea, um, that we have to share our light and we have to be as proud and as, and as open as possible. And, and that is our greatest antidote is, is just being more proud and, and more, you know, um, I guess, 
willing to share that with the, with the rest of the world. And so with that in mind, I, I want to turn the conversation to um, a couple of our, our younger, our younger Hasbara fellows who are, my, my dog is joining the call, um, to a couple of younger Hasbara fellows who are really boots on the ground doing amazing work uh, via social media on their respective campuses in their high school, high schools across the board. So um, Daniel, I don't know if you're ready, but we, we'd we love to bring in one of our students and, and get rolling with a Q&A. Hi, Shani, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> good, so I know you have a question. I'm gonna just hand over the floor to you and, and go for it. Sure, so, um, so basically I started a club on campus on my campus, which doesn't really have a lot of Jews. And I also started a blog, which I'm struggling to create content for and like grow because it's really hard to find the headspace of like what content to prepare or what, like it's usually just like what comes to mind. So Leora, what message would you give to other Jewish girls on social media who also want to help stop anti-Semitism? And um, my- so if no, 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 I got it. Um, so I, um, I remember when I was like 17, um, I was personally born in Lithuania and um, 16 or 17, this happened is when Lithuania was trying to enter the European Union. Um, and once you enter the European Union, economic benefits galore. Um, and I remember at the time, uh, multiple Jewish cemeteries were desecrated, like horrifically desecrated. And I had written a letter to the Lithuanian ambassador um, in America. And I received this bogus message back. I wrote another letter and copied um, a DC uh, local channel and they actually featured um, my anger and outrage. And I'll never forget the, I, I couldn't sleep that night. I was so angry and just this fire and passion inside of me really like, I felt like I was living. So if, I don't wanna make it sound hokey, but if you find content that gives you this energy, this is what you should be doing. So whether it's focusing um, on exposing different facets of anti-Semitism, whether it's um, pro-Israel work, whatever that excites you and get in, ignites that fire that's what I would suggest to be focusing on yeah I kind of like I started it and then I was like creating content and then every day it was just like whatever comes to mind or what day it like I don't know like I would see other people posting so then I would come up with my own thing it's also it's more about life in diaspora it's called diaspora diaries so okay it's more of like what life is like for a Jewish person living in diaspora Okay. Um, and I yeah. have to tell you, I'm, um, I'm personally from Cleveland, Ohio. So I know while Cleveland had a very um, large Jewish population, surprisingly, if you drove an hour South, you, you have people that's never met a Jew in their life. So yes. I can't imagine being a 20 year old living in an area like that. So I can tell you that if I knew this growing up, that there's thousands and thousands of other people um, 20 year olds that would be very interested in what you have to say. And again, if that's what you love to do, that's what you should create content about. Yeah. Thank it has you. to come from the heart. Yeah, all, my, all my blogs are very like heartfelt and less like, like Great. Right, a few facts, but they're mostly like based on personal experience, like either my grandparents experiences or like what it's like being mixed. So yeah. Do, do whatever. I always say, do whatever gives you that fire. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one that grew up being told I have to be a, a doctor or a lawyer. Right. So clearly I didn't become either, but I always tell my young daughter is whatever you do, do that gives you that passion. I'm so lucky to be able to do what I love as my full-time work because it doesn't feel like work um, yeah. day in and day out. So if you have that fire, that's what's going to make you successful and what kind of content you want to put out. And I promise you, if you're feeling so-and-so, there's lots of other people feeling the same way. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Shani. What a great question. This is this is definitely something that as another Jewish girl in diaspora, I too will be thinking about how I can integrate that kind of approach to my online presence as well. So thank you for that great question, Shani. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Good. So I know you have a question for our fabulous um, experts. So I'm just going to hand the floor over to you and, and take it away. Okay. I'm Rena, and I'm a Hasbara High School intern. My question is for Rudy. You've spoken to many anti-Israel activists on and off campus. Are there any situations that stand out where you truly change that person's mind about Israel and Zionism? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It happens all the time. Um, whenever I'm engaging with someone, first of all, something that most people don't realize when they're watching the videos is I have no idea the person's positions or what they're going to say. So a lot of times people say, oh, why didn't you tell them in the, this in the beginning? Why didn't you tell her that uh, before? I didn't know what they were going to say. I don't know their positions. But my outlook is always that there's a potential spark within this human being to be able to see the truth and become a better person. So I always approach it in that way. And I think that at first, with a lot of people that are more extreme in terms of their anti-Semitism or their anti-Israel bias, because they were either misguided or because of the traumas that they've experienced themselves, that it takes maybe a few minutes for them to get their anger out and for them to start to build trust, to start to see our humanity. And unfortunately, a lot of times we have to put ourselves in a situation of taking the, those hits, taking those shots and showing them that that's you're not actually fighting me you're fighting something else. And I'm actually on your side. And plenty of times, whether in that conversation itself, uh, someone has come to realization that, you know, it's not the way that they saw the world or, you know, whenever you're having a conversation, you may not change their minds in the moment. You may be planting seeds that take time to water and to cultivate and to grow and eventually they change their mind so all the time I get messages from people oh I had a conversation with you on this campus a few years ago and since then I've been following your content and you've really changed the way I see things or even never meeting them just them watching my videos and them seeing the world in a different way so definitely there's a lot of positivity but I really think that the change is going to come from the people on the ground and that's what I do with Habayit, the home in Israel, is I unite, well, we unite Israelis and Palestinians on the local level. So the real representation, the real leaderships. So, for example, in the Palestinian communities, it's not really the Palestinian authority that represents the people. They're the ones controlling the people. But the real representations are the families of Kfah Hussan, of Nablus, of Hebron, the families that run the clans of these communities. And if you start building relations with the younger generation within these communities, within these uh, groups that actually hold a position of leadership within their own society, then all of a sudden you're creating humanization. One side is understanding that the other are human beings. They're understanding that we shouldn't be polarized and see each other as mutually, mutually exclusive for achieving liberation and actually understanding the experiences that we both deal with in order to envision a future that we can create together. And that's the way I think that we can actually change things. Of course, those individuals that cross the line and that there's nothing to do, they're just pure hateful and that they're just taking up the space and hijacking the space of other people trying to talk about their issues. We need to expose them simultaneously. But I think in the way that they say things, they're exposing themselves. So I definitely think that there's a lot of change to be had. And I think a lot of people come into uh, a conversation with people that are anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, and they get very flustered and they get very angry and very upset. Now I'm like a double earth sign, very grounded individual, always been. Um, but I think when we put ourselves in those situations, we have to realize that in those moments, we represent way more than just ourselves. In those moments, we represent the collective that we belong to. And it may that maybe that individual or the people that are even listening to that conversation, maybe their first time that they hear from a Jew, and it may be their last time that they hear from a Jew. And so in that moment, you have the responsibility to tell the collective story of the people you represent, even if you were not elected to it. So I think that when we look at the situation in that way and you approach, you approach people with compassion and with a real desire to find, you know, common ground and to have them understand and for you also to learn and to understand that sometimes, most of the time, in my opinion, people will see through that and accept you and be able to move forward. But you also have to have patience and, um, and compassion. Rina, that's such a great question. And, and you know, I, I, I don't know about you, Rina, but when I see, um, you know, the screenshots of, of some of the messages that Rudy gets from people who um, have seen his videos and maybe didn't speak to him, but literally just saw them online, I'm always like so, you know, 
I, I, I get so empowered by seeing um, the success that, that Rudy's having through these conversations. And, you know, as someone who's a double water sign, I tend to be on the more emotional side of the spectrum. But, um, I'm, a, but I'm a fire sign. Aries, oh, Rudy, for sure, hats off for sure. to you. Your <laughs> there we go. Like, godly. I mean, all of us who don't have the Zodiac covered. But, <laughs> um, but just, you know, uh, seeing that, seeing the way that Rudy's been able to maintain that calmness and, and and that composure, I feel like it's very impactful for me. And, and I, I don't know, maybe it is for you too, Rena. But anyway, it's a great question. Thank you so much for, 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 for asking it. <laughs> Hi, Kayam. How's it going? Great. How are you? Good. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a question. So I'm going to hand the floor off to you and go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, hi, Rudy. Uh, I'm Chaim Strauss. I'm from Toronto, Canada. I go to Yeshiva or Chaim, and I am a Hasbara high school intern. Uh, so, my question was, um, do, you, uh, do you think that the recent peace deals between Israel and the, some Arab countries will make BDS less effective on campus? And as fellow activists, how can we build on this momentum? Sure. So first of all, I definitely appreciate and love the fact that Israel's becoming a more integral part of the Middle East. That's definitely a vision that I have for the Jewish people. I think we should be playing soccer with Middle Eastern countries, singing in competition with Middle Eastern countries and having great relations with those countries. And not only great relations, but also helping those countries and using our lights that we have in the technology, cybersecurity, water technology that we've created, whether drip irrigation, desalinization, recycling and sewage water and helping countries like Yemen that have huge drought issues. Um, so I definitely am amazed by the fact that this is happening in our lifetime. I think a lot of us wouldn't imagine this happening a year or two years ago, uh, but I think it's beautiful. In terms of BDS, I think we need to understand what BDS actually is. A lot of people tend to define all of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism as BDS, whereas I see anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism as a tree, and BDS is really a twig off of a branch off of this tree. And when we defeat a BDS resolution, we feel like we've won because we've made the problem BDS when it's just a symptom of the actual deeper problem. So what is a BDS resolution? It's a resolution where student government decides to pass uh, this bill that says that the school should divest from Israel. Okay. Every single time that it has passed on a campus, no school has actually divested. And even if a school divested from Israel, how much is that really impacting Israel, you know, in the first place? So, yes, it is a symbolic loss and it is a problem if they pass. But the deeper problem is not if this resolution passes or not. It's the fact that it's even OK to speak about it. That is the loss. So regardless of if it you know, gets shut down completely. The fact that this is a part of the conversation on campus and that it's brought up every single year that shifts the pop culture, that shifts the mindset of the next generation on a college campus because they are the future political and intellectual class of the next generation. They will go into politics, they would go into business, they will go into law, they will go into media. And even if this resolution isn't passed, it's something that has been ingrained in their mind for four years that pushes ideas that Jews have no right to exist, that they're not a real people, that Israel's the worst thing in the world. And that's the win. So in order to actually solve the problem, it's not about making it legal or illegal from the top down uh, that BDS should not be seen. It's really from the bottom up, getting the culture and the society to recognize what is the problem with BDS and being able to move forward. And if Jews themselves aren't doing that on college campuses, we're not going, we can't expect anyone else, to, anyone else to do that. So I do think that it opens the door, the fact that these peace accords and these deals are, are happening, it opens the door to a lot of uh, Arabs from the Middle East or Middle Easterners in general that, you know, would have been negative towards Israel because that was the position their country took or negative towards Israel because that was the media that they were digesting within their, their community. And now it's less so. So a lot of other Arab students would be open to the idea of normalizing relations and having, you know, conversations or being open minded to Israeli. So I do think it does have an impact. But really to, to solve BDS, we have to shift the pop culture from the ground up and not only from the top down. They're both important. But I think the Jewish community has focused way too much of their efforts on the top down rather than the bottom up. Uh, thank you very much. Question. Thank you, Chaim. That's a great question. And I'm glad we have this opportunity. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> Hi, Ellie. How's it going? I am good. How are you? Great. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know you have a question uh, for Leora, so I'm going to pass the floor over to you. 
Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Ellie and I'm in grade 12 and I've been a high school Hasbro fellow for three years now. It's such a pleasure to get this chance to virtually meet you, Rudy and Leora. You both do such a great job advocating on social media. So my question is for Leora. You've run two pretty different social media accounts with Jewish Chick and Stop Anti-Semitism. So I was wondering, do you keep these two personas completely separate? Um, I try to, um, although it's getting a little bit more and more difficult with the stopantisemitism.org social media platforms, that doesn't represent my personal beliefs. Um, my Jewish chick channels still do. So um, I understand how sometimes it can be confusing for people, but if I delve into some controversial topics, um, on my Jewish chick pages, I preface that by saying these are my personal opinions. These are not the opinions of my organizations, of my organization and the multiple other people that participate um, in our in our efforts. Just like, for instance, if you, um, you know, you approach somebody at the Simon Wiesenthal Center um, their chief technology officer, for instance, um, might be saying one thing on Twitter, but may not, you know, their organization might not be espousing the same beliefs on their organ um, via their organizational platforms. Thank Did I answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. That was a great question. And I mean, that's amazing that you've done Hasbro all through high school. And I'm sure whatever university campus or college campus or wherever you end up is going to be so lucky to have you. So thank you so much for joining and for that great question. Thank you so much. I, I really just I want to thank Leora. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Rudy, it's always a pleasure to have you here. This has been I mean, such a privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak to you both. Um, I, I hope the viewers are enjoying it as much as I've been enjoying it. And um, so I'm going to, if you guys have any last words you want to share, speak now or forever hold your peace. No, I'm just kidding. But if you have any, any parting, parting words for our, for our viewers, any words of wisdom, passing the, the mic over to you, Leora. Um, sure. Um, if you ever have any questions regarding content creation, you can um, always uh, DM us on Instagram. Again, we'll be more than happy to help that um, individual or organization. Um, we're always happy to ally, um, form allyships with others, um, you know, like-minded organizations and individuals. Um, again, if time allows, we're there to help. Amazing. Thank you so much. Rudy, any, any parting words for our viewers before we wrap up the session? Well, anyone who viewed this and is watching this, um, you know, I appreciate, you know, giving the time and the energy and the space to be able to engage with what is actually happening. And I hope you take this and use it in your own life to make you a better person. Also spread it to others because there's no one source. We're all part of connected to, to the source and all of us are just trying to, you know, transmit the message. And thank you to you and to Hasbro Fellowships for continuously, you know, being on the ground every single day and trying to help empower students and being a resource for everyone. Um, I think it's an amazing job that you guys are doing. I've had, you know, a relationship with Hasbro Fellowships for several years, and I hope just to see it grow and to continue and to see more students come out of that. Amazing. And with that, Thank you both so much again. This has been really such such a privilege. And you know, I can't thank you, I can't thank you enough, both of you. And um, so last time I'll say it, but thank you so much for this for this amazing session. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic back over to Daniel. So thanks so much, everyone who's been watching, and bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you to Farah, Rudy, and Leora. That was very educational. I'm sure we all learned a lot uh, about how to become a social media activist today. And I think it also serves as a reminder for the need for us to stand up and be vocal. My friends, I've said it before, there is a movement out there trying to hijack our identity, hijack the Jewish experience, and rewrite what it means to be a Jewish person today. As Jews, and as Canadians and Americans of conscience, we cannot allow that to happen. I hope that we all utilize the lessons that we've learned today. And I ask all of you again to support Hasbara today at hasbarafellowships.org donate. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. 
Laila Tov, have a great night.